Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Where we spin the jams and spill the tea And today, boy howdy, do we have a lot of shit we are going to cover today Today, we are planning on covering four records total Including our Record Club episode today Which, be on the lookout for that But in this episode, main this week episode We are covering the new album by rock legends the foo fighters we are covering their new album medicine at midnight and we are covering the new album from post-punk outfit black country new road for the first time and we are also covering our very own sersha sersha and the agenda we are covering panic attacks in public and then after that, we are going to be talking about Tyler's recommended album this week, which is The Cardiacs and their album, Sing, Sing to, to God. God. So, God, we have the stuff. And today we are also joined by podcast veteran, Laura. <laughs> Welcome to the show once again. Yes, Laura will be joining us for reviews for the new release reviews of Foo Fighter and Black Country New Road, and I'm sure we'll be <laughs> spilling the tea in true jams and tea fashion uh, hmm. in both did instances. You guys, did you guys get to the joke with the Black Country New Road album because it's their debut and they call it for the first time? That's that's pretty that's good stuff. But uh, let's talk about what we've been listening to this week, shall we? Please. Yes. And Jake, what have you been listening to this week? Um, honest to God, um, in complete opposite of what is my brand, I have really not listened to all that much just because I have been working so much on my writing. By the way, volume four is still out now. <laughs> um, uh, but I have uh, had a bit more limited uh, listening time just because I have had a lot of stuff to listen to for the stuff this week. And some of the stuff is kind of long. So um I will say I did listen to Inspired by um, uh, Morgan uh, talking about this album and talking about it with uh, another podcast veteran, Zach. I listened to uh, Death From Above's You're a Woman, I'm a Machine, which, bro, that shit goes. It's so yeah. good. Like, I can't believe I haven't found this band until now. Like, oh my God, it's like 35 minutes of some of the most invigorating rock music I've ever heard. And it's just like mm -hmm. the silliest fucking lyrics I've ever heard, but I'm just on board for it. <laughs> I think my favorite part was like, doesn't at one point they they just say like, I, they they see a woman and they're just like, I want to start a family. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah, no, like that's, that's his pickup line in the club. Uh, <laughs> like, let's get together and start a family. Uh, which you know, like, same man. Like, My panties that's, that's are just... wet. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of the, of the death grip line of responsibility is nice, but there are other things to life, like getting my dick right all night. It's the polar opposite to that. <laughs> exactly. There's the two genders. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, exactly. <laughs> uh, another album I listened to uh, in preparation for this week uh, was by Cardiacs, their uh, album A Little Man in a House and the Whole World Window, uh, which I enjoyed very much. It's, it is an album by the band Cardiax, and I will attempt to describe what their music sounds like later, but I won't now because. Yeah. Ah. It's their, I think it's their second best album, and it has Quite some good. of like some really iconic songs on it. Like, I think the first um, three or four songs on that record are just like Very absolute good. belters. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, it's and, really great. Like, I would recommend, like, um, I don't know if there is a good place to start with them, but that's a pretty good place if you ask me. Yeah, that's that's what I would say as well to new people going into it. Uh, other than that, I listened to, excuse me, I listened to an album by an electronic artist by the name of Owsie. Uh They made an album called Selected Songs. 
uh, which I know about this purely because of a YouTuber whose videos that I watch very frequently. He constantly uses really amazing, like, electronic ambient backing music, and I have to, like, search the world over to find the songs that I like in his videos because I'm just like, oh, that sounds fucking awesome. So I just come across a bunch of shit that I'd never heard of before, and this is one of them. Uh, and that album's really great. Um, it's not particularly long, um, but I listened to it because of uh, an album or a song on the album called like, and they found, uh, they found her body out by the sea, which is just this fucking heart achingly beautiful electronic song. It's just, it's fucking great. Um, listen to that if you get the chance, if that sounds like your, your bag. Um, I gave a re-listen to an album that I believe we're actually going to be covering not soon, but uh, at least sometime in the future, uh, apropos of me, if I remember correctly. Uh, but I listened to Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds Ghostine, um, which that album just literally gets better every single time I hear it. And I gave it a 10 like five listens ago. <laughs> it's it's like every time I hear Sun Forest, I'm just like, there is no one who will ever in the his in, in, in the in history of music and music to come, no one will make anything that sounds this beautiful. It is it is a fact. And uh that is uh not even the best song on the album. So, you know, that's that. Um uh, which I gave a listen to purely because uh, August and I were watching a movie the other night and we were talking about mm. which of us um, on the podcast, like our designated personalities. And August told me that I was like the designated goth person. And so I listened to a bunch of gothic, like Nick Cave and Tom Waits shit, because I was just like, I want to be on brand because if that's, if that's me, then yay, I like that. So that's what yeah, I've been listening to. Care to share? The rest of us? You can't just say oh. that you did that and then fucking only say one of us. Well, I mean, it's I mean, you're the dirt emo, so I mean that's yeah, obvious. That's that's, true. that's the the, yeah. the dirt emo who has the secret pop punk love who like the the dude who jams to Foo Fighters, but also at the same time was jamming to Paramore. Uh, hang, um, hang on, hang on, I've I faced out. How do we get on to dirt emo? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, just like I am transcending excuse me <laughs> I did, we, were, we were just talking about the types of personalities that we occupy yeah, because we're yeah. different mm -hmm. people like Tyler's the, the most storied like musical person just has like an absolutely like chronicled musical history and has like the most in-depth knowledge of shit history wise and genre wise and Sersha obviously folk punk and Brr. also like you know very emotionally charged yeah, yeah. just like you me need to and... say that with the like middle class accent I have or else it doesn't make any sense. folk punk punk yeah yeah. That was my best uh, apropos of that. And uh, August is August is coming into his own. I feel he is he is the one who is in, engaging with all this new music for the first time, and like it's 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 just beautiful to watch the taste develop. It's it's, it's many wonderful. many hand gestures. Hand gestures. That's what I do. It's who yeah. I am. The gothic hand gestures person. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, yeah, I suppose, uh, speaking of myself, I should uh, talk about what I've been listening to. Oh you almost uh, first, planned that. Yeah, first up, the debut record from 10trix.never titled Betrayed in the Octagon, where we see uh, Daniel Lopten kind of uh, obviously on his first record doing a lot of droney stuff with the uh, kind of two centerpieces of this album, which total up to about a 20-minute long kind of singular drone piece and some more uh some like very early uh progressive electronic exploration you hear a lot of echoes of what he does later it's obviously not very refined it's very dirty sounding and it's not like amazing but because i really do like uh one of tricks point never it's a very uh very good listen to kind of see what what sparked the fire that would become like my favorite records from him and that is very much on display here and what um, was what's the name of the album again sorry uh betrayed, betrayed in the octagon uh but what, 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 yeah when you said that i brain was immediately like ah i love the mars falter 
what's which... what i what's so i like so much about that title is that in the city where i live in the central area of the city where most people kind of like congregate and where you have like big social events is called the octagon um mm. so that paints a very specific image to me that i find I really funny yeah um, no Anyway. Uh, next thing was Foo Fighters uh, Color and the Shape, which I listened to in preparation for this. Uh, it's a it's quite a good record. I think I think pretty decent. The singles yeah. are, are a little head and shoulders above everything else on there, but that's not to say there aren't like good tracks in between those moments. Uh, it's it's just a pretty enjoyable uh, enjoyable kind of '90s rock record. It's uh, it's good. Monkey wrench goes hard. Yeah. Uh, next thing from legendary industrial rock band KMF DMF, I listened to their record Angst, which is kind of this point in their. This is first record I've heard from them, as I understand. It's the point when they kind of crossed more into the mainstream and that's very on display with songs like light and sucks and it's it's a record with a really great personality and a sense of humor about itself while also just having some really rocking heavy tunes on it so recommend checking that one out if you're not all that familiar with them uh next thing uh dinosaur juniors you're living all over me Yes, uh, love that album. It's a yeah, it's a really good kind of noise, kind of really noisy, lo-fi, uh, very emotionally charged record. Almost some like touches of like proto shoegaze stuff on there, and that's mostly that's, a tribute. That record was like super ahead of its time too. It came yeah. out in, like eighty seven. Yeah, and it's, influenced it's crazy. so many of like like what you think of like classic sounds or like classic musical aesthetics of a lot of like 90s alternative bands you can trace back to um dinosaur jr in the late 80s moving on uh last thing i spent a good deal of time with this week was uh james ferraro's record night dolls with hairspray i've been getting into uh james ferraro's discography a lot lately and this is uh Unlike anything else I've heard from him, it's like a, a glam punk pastiche lo-fi record full of these like, it's like the perfect thing I'd recommend. It, it like evokes the images of like making short films with your friends in like your basement is <laughs> the best way I can describe what it sounds like. It's I've done really, that many a times. So yeah. that sounds fun. Yeah, it's it's crazy fun. The lyrics are are hilarious. Like there's there's one song called Killer Nerd, which is details the story of a uh, kind of uh, nerdy type character going around the s shooting up a school and it's hilarious. Uh, yeah, it's got a great sense of humor. I imagine if that's kind of your your thing, if that description sounds appealing to you, you'd like it a lot. Uh, that's what I've been listening to. I'm just on uh, James Ferraro's Rate Your Music page, and I'm in awe of how many different alter egos or also known oh, yeah. names He's this dude has. Insane. Like, I, there's got to be him. at least 20, 30 different um, th names that he's recorded under here. Uh, and some yeah. of them composition of the sensibilities of melted knowledge cruising the night biker strip 1977 um what else menstrual chinese dream uh, new age panther mystique pandolphinic dawn these sound like of montreal album titles it may, making the world is a beautiful place and i'm no longer afraid to die seem fucking pedant Purple yeah, gongs, he's... sky mirror balm in preparation for deja vu. Uh, <laughs> this dude he's, is he's wild. He's awesome. He's awesome is what I can say. I've been listening to him since 2019 and uh, he's just so fucking funny and fun. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So Morgan, what have you been listening to? Uh, uh, the only thing of note that I haven't been listening to for the podcast. Uh, 
is the uh, the podcast favorite Miles Davis bitches brew, and like I mean, uh, fuck, <laughs> yeah, he, he tiner go brr. Li- there's I mean literally not a not a person on that record did not go burr. Every <laughs> going, every every single living being who was involved went burr for an hour and forty five minutes straight without stopping. And yeah. I uh, my my review of it on Music Board was I want to take a, a a vinyl record of this, uh, throw it in, in a wood chipper or something like that, mm. and then take the grounds that came out of the other side of the wood chipper, roll them up in a blunt and smoke it. Um, I have a vinyl. We can do that. And I, I, I stand by that. Do you have a wood chipper, though? Uh, we can find one. Me and the homies when the vaccine drops. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, also, worth men- Miles also, Davis. also worth mentioning as well, I'm sure you probably were going to bring it up anyway, that uh, Morgan listening to this record is particularly poignant considering that we lost uh, Chick Corea this week who, um, oh, plays, yeah. who plays keys on, I think, every song on the record and, and basically every single Miles Davis fusion record, the keys are either being played invaluable part of those records the keys are either being played by him or herbie hancock or joe zawinul those three on um miles fusion records and that key sound uh that electric piano sound is just such a core part of the identity of the miles davis fusion sound like what makes it so attractive and special and ethereal um, so an immense talent, uh, lived a long and incredibly productive life. Um, shout out to Chick. Yeah, it's, um, he's certainly no exception to this, but like literally every person involved with Bitches Brew was like, we talk about how Miles Davis is a genius all the time and like fucking, yeah, um, no takes there. If you have <laughs> a take, you're stupid. Yeah. Um, but like every single person involved was a, a genius in their own right. Probably only a little bit below Miles in that metric. Yeah. Um, and as such, it's just fucking he invented music. I. What do you want from me? Yeah, that's that's my current favorite jazz album. I don't really see it being topped anytime soon, unless well, it is in fact by Miles Davis. Well. I mean, no, yeah, one, no one's really going to fight you on that, I will say. Yeah. I am going to try to listen to Get Up With It, though, Tyler, at your recommendation, because I, I couldn't listen to it one night these past week because my internet was shoddy and it kept stopping on that first track. And I was just like, fucking, fucking stop. I want to enjoy this. This is fucking good. Yeah, like, it's, it's a long album, obviously. It's, it's two yeah. hours, but like... That first piece, the He Loved Him Madly, fucking... Wow! Yeah, wow. it's, it's out of this world. Like it's nothing like anything else mm-hmm. Miles Davis had done before. Like it's proto ambient. It's but it's also got these really um, just sort of stark and 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 startling solos th- throughout it. And fucking yeah, gorgeous. Honestly, I, I it's not there yet, but I could see get up with it eventually being my favorite Miles record. Yeah, from what I've heard of it, I mean, just damn. Um, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, jingle jangle problem on our hands. Miles Davis going nuts. Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's for those four people out there who watch Game yeah. Grumps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's all I got to. Sersha, what have you been listening to? Um, I also listened to a Miles Davis record this week, that being um, Tribute to Jack Johnson. Uh, I understand that this was conceived as a soundtrack to a documentary about the the very man. Um, thank God, the very boy. The, boy does this stand up on its own merit outside of that documentary in the way that really great soundtracks do. Um, hot damn! Yeah. This album is incredible. Right um, off the side, I mean, both sides are great, but right off is is has a shot at being the best composition. Um, and fun fact, it's actually Jack Johnson's actually Miles Davis's own favorite of his records. Wow, worth it. That's, I mean, that's crazy. Uh, this is a good choice. Um, I yeah. am, I, I'm, 
I'm probably more partial to yes and no, actually. That just really made my heart sing. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful pace. Ah, oh, God, I want to go but, listen to yeah, it right yeah. now. I've got that on vinyl right over there. I fucking love that album. Mm. It's like, it's half an hour long. Uh, made right after Bitches Brew, I think. Um, mm-hmm. It's half an hour long. Um, fucking killer. Uh, it's not quite in the sort of early 70s Miles Davis prog short albums canon. It's not quite in the silent way. But what is, it's just incredible. Um, I loved it two pieces. Um, for reasons that become evident as podcast goes on, I went back today to listen to Spyland by Slint. Oh, uh, yeah. This, this was my <laughs> second listen, and it only got better, um, and I already loved it. Yes. Uh, just The thing is, like, yeah, uh, the last track on it, Good Morning, Captain, gets, like, a lot of love, and it is an incredible song probably like my favorite on the record but jesus christ the rest of it is so immaculate and perfect and brilliant um yeah just i think an... my favorite is washer i think that's the one Washer's that i always yeah. i always come back to the most but yeah. that whole um, album is flawless yeah i don't know my my pick would be uh don oh Man. yes yes that's my second favorite that song oh, was yeah. it, it they're all great i can't disagree with any choices yeah. i just i just Those... can't those lads are from just up the road. Are they yes, really? Yes, they're from Car- Kentucky. Louisville. Yes. Louisville. Wow. Yeah. Oh wow! I did not know that. Louisville. Um, Lu- Louisville. <laughs> I thought they were British. So okay. Louis. Louisville. <laughs> you what? <laughs> the the I don't know why. I've heard it once. <laughs> um, Kentucky, Britain, stones throw away. <laughs> London. Yeah. I mean. I, I'm from Britain. I've been to Kentucky. I'm sure that's I'm yeah. sure that's what they had in mind. Yeah, ab- absolutely. When making yeah. the album. <laughs> I, I mean, to be to be fair, I've, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in both uh, Kentucky, obviously, mm. um, but also the you know countryside of England. Mm. Not not at all that different, really. Mm. Um, R- lots of rolling hills. Of, Lots of rolling hills, lots of uh, uh, middle middle class folk. And turkey of, fried chicken. Less than God, fuck, fuck. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken did not start in Kentucky. Yeah, was it? Was yeah. it Tennessee? Tennessee, Tennessee. Yeah, I knew it. You know, it did start in Kentucky. The cheeseburger, which is a better food than fried chicken. <laughs> Facts. Well, that's correct. I I, I would agree. I was born in Middle yeah. England. And not Nashville, Tennessee. And the only person in my band is me. Anyway, I also this week the fuck I reckon are you the talking few, about it says Frank Turner first. Okay. Mm. Frank Turner bars. verse. He dropping bars. <laughs> not bars. Well, Frank I can't t- say Frank Turner lines, it's multiple lines. What what, what do you F- want? T. Couplet. I want to make fun of you. That's what I want. <laughs> well, you can do that anytime you want. It's fine. I do um, I will. I can and I will. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a disaster the show is. Anyway, and, and, and now I listen to twice this week, really by coincidence, because I listened to it on a whim, and then without my knowing, it had a 50th anniversary this week, so I listened to it again. Uh, that being Tapestry by Carol King, one of my favorite singer songwriter records. Uh, I will not talk too much about it because it's a planned future record club. So um, I'm going to wait until then to really go in depth, but I love it. Oh, to hey. Not for me. Good album. I said, "Wah hey, wah hey, mm. indeed." Anyway, uh, I listened to a wonderful folk record called "Color Green" by Sybil Be- Bear. Bear, one of them. Um, oh, yeah. Just very haunting folk record. Uh, there's uh, there are a few songs on it that are immaculate, but specifically, "I Lost Something in the Hills" is just absolutely haunting and captivating. Love to pieces. Uh, and the fifth record I'm going to talk about is uh podcore it has was my first list well podcore for some of us it was my first listen and it's immediately entered into my canonical favorite records overnight that <gasps> oh, being yeah. uh one dying star by russ and kelly um tyler visibly let yeah. down. <laughs> 
I don't know what I expected. No, it's a great album. Nice. Like I just yeah, I'm just playing up, playing up. Tyler, if you didn't <laughs> think that was a great album, we would we would go to New Zealand and kill you. Don't I I would not. I would just tell you not to be a stupid little bitch on my show. You know, here, here's the thing. Uh Saoirse, you saying podcore for some of us, I was just like immediately had it in my head. Okay, this is something I haven't heard or don't like. So it was like it's yeah. a safe, that's a safe bet, August, with you. Yeah. Mm yeah I, it's just any record we mention haven't heard don't like <laughs> <laughs> weird it's gay get rid of it don't like it yeah. um, it's a phenomenally like emotionally naked record um i i don't think that uh shape and destroy quite prepared me for how full-on the emotions yeah. on this record are um specifically i want to i want to uh shout out just for the record uh, Mercury, Blackout, Faceplant, Son of a Highway, Daughter, Mockingbird, Cuff, all of them really. Um, Mercury is a top 10 of all time song. Yeah, for real. That's for real. Dying just Star, the, Junkyard Heart, just some kid very, kicking outside of some yeah, bar. Very few records uh, combine extraordinarily frank and dark emotional inspection of the self with being so full of great hooks and lines as this record does um a good hearty yee-haw <sighs> got more hooks than a fucking fishing store on that album hey hey hoo-ha it's just true um it, the it is a fishing store i don't know go to fucking <laughs> go go to lake dale hollow you'll find a fucking fishing store yeah if someone tries to say that there know, was like a thing best like grow shop that's a there you go. Hey, there you go. There you are. If, if someone... they have a lot, they have an awful lot of guns there for a fishing <laughs> store, which is interesting. Yeah, you know, you gotta you gotta shoot the fish. That's the whole aim, <laughs> right? Y- y'all ever see uh, secondhand lines? Yes, um, actually, Haley Joel Osment in it, and Saw that two uncles are, are played by Robert Duvall and Michael Caine. It's a pretty great movie, honestly. But the way that they fish is they go out to the little pond. Uh, beside their house that probably has like three fish in it and they just fucking shoot them with shotguns. <laughs> uh, that's a good movie. Most American anyway. fucking thing I've ever heard. So, if someone was to go up to you and uh, not know what Dirt Emo was and you wanted to give them like a pinnacle example of what that might sound like, this is the record. I'm just imagining the scenario of you walking down the street and a stranger just approaches Please you. Please tell me, what is Dirty Mo? I must know. <laughs> it's Dirty Mo. Well, I mean... Have you accepted Dirty Mo as your lord and savior? <laughs> well, Do you I have mean, a moment look, to talk I... about our lord and savior, Russell Kelly? <laughs> I, have a, I have a sticker that says that on it on my laptop. I have a sweatshirt that says it on it. It's, it's bound to happen. Yeah, is all I'm yeah. saying. I have a porcupine <laughs> tree sticker on my computer. I have been asked what the hell that is many times. Have like, you ever like a... walked through a bush and like there are lots of pines on a tree that feel very sharp? That's what a porcupine tree is. I hope Stephen Wilson just like shoots you in the back of the head. What <laughs> was any of that? <laughs> Just, Tyler, what have you been listening to this week? Just, re- just revealed that Stephen Wilson has a hitman style barcode on the back of his head. <laughs> been waiting for this moment. Yep. And the way he's going to murder us all is with future bites. Is it, a- you a- bite my 30. ass. He, he, he would be Agent 34 because of Voyage 34. Uh... That's a good one. That's a good Tyler, one by me. Tyler, what, what have you been listening to this week? Quickly. Well, um, I've been listening to a lot of music actually because I wasn't on the podcast last week. So I'm going to try and jaunt through a bunch of shit I've been listening to in the last two weeks. Um, uh, I listened to, I'm, I'm not going to talk about everything, obviously. I'll just say, shout out some things. I listened to the first Ulver record, um, oh. Berg. Ooh. Yeah. Um, uh, which is a, a fantastic uh, record. Um, I absolutely loved it. It's quite short um it opens with an incredible piece of music which is probably I, I i must admit i don't have i have listened to a fair bit of atmospheric black metal but not enough to call myself like a connoisseur but it's probably the best if not top three uh pieces of atmospheric black metal i've ever heard the opening track on that record is outstanding and really the whole thing is just 
superb. It's only 35 minutes long. It reminded me at points of um, early Opeth, um, but mm. better than early Opeth. I'm talking like the first two albums. No, yeah. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and then the presence, uh, uh, the vocal presence on the record is, is, is superb. The uh, folk influences tied up in it as well. Obviously it reminded me of things like Egalock and stuff, but uh, all of these comparisons are favorable. Um, it carves out its own really unique niche. And I'm particularly interested in getting into the discography of Olver because I'm aware that it goes into some strange um, and unexpected left turns that I am looking forward to experiencing. It, it's um, funny you mentioned that because I'm actually familiar with this band because they released an album last year and it's oh, fucking yeah. bizarre to me that you said when they were just like, oh, atmospheric black metal. And I'm just like, uh, yeah, Flowers of Evil is fucking record. not that. Yes. It is yes. not even close yeah. to that. Like, so, uh, I got a picture of like the, uh, yeah, something the Joan of Arc Joan on of Arc. it. Yeah, 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 that's it. Like, yeah, their, their stuff is crazy. It starts like black metal. It's like trip hop at one point. Then it's yeah. ambient. <laughs> yeah it's it's nonsense yeah and then that's awesome. fucking that's and, and considering that those a lot of those records uh, after that um shift are still quite beloved that really intrigues me um to see yeah, how they yeah. pull that off so i'm looking forward to experiencing that um they do have a fucking catalog holy shit i what else am i going to shout out i listened to uh i listened to fella cooties album expensive shit um hmm. Fella Cutie is, of course, a landmark um, uh, musician in the world of Afrobeat and funk music. Um, uh, and his records are filled with like dense arrangements of um, jazz funk with lots of weird polyrhythms and stuff. But also, at, it's at the core of it, it's incredibly addictive and um, catchy and just fucking awesome um expensive shit's only 24 minutes long it's a short record but it's very captivating the entire time that it's on and i find i found it deeply amusing to learn that the title is literal and refers to an, a story in which uh a man is imprisoned by the police um for drug possession and so uh, when they're trying to search him he swallows the drugs um, and then so they're like, okay, we're going to wait and just, um, you know, take his stool sample and we're going to get him for the drugs and his stool sample. So he uh, purchases the stool of, an, of another inmate who charges him an exorbitant price for his stool. So it's literally a story about an expensive shit. Wow, um, that's, uh, that's, so f I, I love Harmony Kareen. <laughs> no, but like that's, that's, that's. Like, if you were just listening to the record, you had no idea that that story was being told. Uh, Fela Kuti sings in kind of like a, a pidgin English that's kind of a hybrid of um, his native African language. I'm um, sorry, I don't know a huge amount about Fela Kuti, so I'm coming across a bit uh, lacking in knowledge, but I really enjoyed the record. Uh, uh, it's just fantastic. Uh, it's, it's basically perfect. Like, I couldn't, I sat down and I listened to all 24 minutes of it. The grooves are so tight. Uh, everything about it is amazing. I can't fault a single aspect of it. Uh, and, and it's a classic album, obviously, um, in that world uh, of Afrobeat and, and jazz funk in the 70s. So, if, yeah, it was just catching up on it for me. And I loved the hell out of it. Um, I also listened to... Um, <laughs> you thought I was done with this band. Uh, I also listened to the first of Steely Dan's two post-reunion albums, um so they obviously as you all know because of me they had a string of seven records in the 70s that are widely beloved and then they took a break um for 20 years and came back in the year 2000 with a record called two against nature um and what's most well known about this record actually has nothing to do with the album itself but the fact that it won the album of the year grammy in a year in which it was competing with uh, Radiohead's Kid A and Eminem's, shit. and Eminem's The Marshall Mathers LP. And so there was like a, a literal oh. outcry uh, and it was, it kind of encapsulated a lot of the perception of, of Steely Dan as an identity comes from the backlash to that event. Like you might not think, oh, it's the Grammys, who gives a shit? But like people were people were mad when that happened like people were really upset it, it's it, the kendrick macklemore thing all over again 
<laughs> yeah, I, I suppose it is. I mean, obviously, that's a completely different cultural I mean... thing. But... <laughs> But I would not equate Steely Dan to Mr. Mac Lemore. Well, I'm not but, saying you know. it's a one-to-one -one comparison. <laughs> I'm just saying it's like nobody gives a shit about the Grammys and everybody's fucking whatever. But when that happened, people lost their fucking mind. Well, and I, I think kind of what exacerbated it was that um, people probably did go out and buy Two Against Nature. And if you're not into Steely Dan, this is a very slow moving and languid record. It is absolutely not the place I would ever recommend anyone start with them. Uh, it's it's definitely a for the fans album. I enjoyed it quite a bit, uh, but even I had to admit that it's the first time I listened to it, it was pretty slow going. Uh, what really I think saves it is the fact that despite the 20 year break, um, lead singer and songwriter Donald Fagan had not lost any of the edge that made his songwriting so great. Like these, there are songs the songs on this record are about, there's a, the opening song on this record is called Gaslighting Abbey. And it's basically about a man and his lover secretly plotting together to convince the man's wife that she's going crazy um, so that he, they, get, they can, he can get a divorce and they can run away together. And I love a, Park Chan Wook's The Handmaiden. <laughs> well, and uh, there's another song on this record called Cousin Dupree, which is about this kind of like um, hipster dude who's like has this incredibly inflated ego and comes home to visit his family and decides he's going to try and seduce his 16 year old cousin. Um, and <laughs> And like literally there's these it's like Tyler it's like every single thing you say it's like you're trying to convince me never to listen to this band <laughs> ever well that's yeah. fine that's fine uh, I mean the, what my point is this is a record that's very kind of acerbic and the content is very kind of edgy but not like Donald is Fagan is such a great writer that it's very kind of like what is happening in these songs is more suggested than outright stated um, but he does that in a way that's very kind of like gives you just enough crumb of the narrative to kind of keep you moving forward into the song and wondering what's going to happen next. And then the songs always have this certain level of ambiguity when they end. So you can't tell whether, for instance, um, the gaslighting has worked or the cousin seduction has worked or whether this person is just kind of, because these songs are all first person perspectives, you kind of get unreliable narrator stories in a lot of um, Steely Dan songs. And you can't tell whether what's actually happening is a reflection of reality or just like how the, the character wants to see things. But anyway, um, if that puts you off Steely Dan, that's fair enough. I will say their other earlier records for the most part don't get quite as taboo as this one. They're much more, uh, there's still hints of, the, of this kind of taboo stuff in the, their music, but it, this record is kind of like, I think leaning into it a little bit, just kind of as a, an, a little bit of an extra way to say kind of fuck you to the people who kind of disregarded their music as kind of like boring by crafting these songs that are very kind of like subversive and ugly. But anyway, yeah, don't listen to this album if you're not, already a huge fan of steely dan they've got plenty of other records that are much more accessible than this one but i want to listen to countdown to eggs to see you'll yeah, like that album yeah, he'll he'll like that one but mm, i wanted to shout mm, this out no. because um <laughs> well, it's fine you know that's fine do what you want i'm committed to, i'm committed to the bit at this point <laughs> that do was fine. fair do what you want i just wanted to shout this one out because um it, it gets so swept up in the grammy narrative that i've never really seen anyone actually talking about what the record is anyway um, fine, I will move on to something that is a little more universally beloved um, that I also happened to discover this week and have fallen in love with, and that is the uh, Jar of Flies EP from Alison <gasps> yeah. Chains. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it might might be all right. <laughs> so I, I I obviously this this EP's reputation preceded it for me, but I wasn't fully prepared for just how uh, phenomenal it is um it's really depression. something else it, 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 it's like yeah, yeah depression it's like it captures like there's a real kind of lifetime of pain in this ep like it, it, it's raw but at the same time it's so soft that you feel like if you hold it too tightly it'll shatter into pieces um I mean, Nutshell, obviously, is an iconic song, and it, it is one of the purest and saddest things I've ever heard. 
Um, it, it just is gut wrenching. Um, but yeah, I want to shout out just how gorgeous this EP sounds, even mm. before you get into uh, the songs themselves, which are immaculate. Um, it's just absolute. It's an absolute textural feast for the ears. Um, and and Jerry Cantrell is basically oh. like he's cucking everyone who's ever played a guitar on this record. Literally, um, tell me about it. He's just uh, like KK Downing. Fuck you! I'll spit in your face. Um, it's, it's, it's. Yeah, I just had. I, I put this on, and like within, I think about definitely before ten minutes had passed, I was in tears, and I was just you. You like, in the group chat, you're like, I'm having a moment. I was just like, I sit here in my home, and and I'm assaulted, and I just had to like. I was just staring into space. Listening you to come to me on the day of my daughter's, my wedding. daughter's wedding. And I want to <laughs> shout out, um, I mean, I don't know the fandom, not fandom, God, I didn't like to use that word. It's so inappropriate. I don't know the like, what fans, obviously from aside from the really iconic songs like Nutshell and Wood, I don't know what fans of Alice in Chains consider their greatest songs. But to me, my favorite track on the record and probably my favorite Alice in Chains song I've heard so far is Don't Follow. Um, oh yeah mm -hmm. i absolutely yeah, I mean, adore uh obviously every song on this record is 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 perfect it's a 10 out of 10 um and mm -hmm. but but that song in particular just like that's the one i've kept coming back to the most um when i uh, am in the mood for it which is <laughs> all the time um but yeah that's all yeah, shout out I, I i listen to at least one thing off of that album every, every single day <laughs> So. I yes, I wish I listened to fucking nutshell in the shower this morning. <laughs> oh God. Uh. God. Yeah. Um but so yeah, obviously. And also that... just like I feel like this isn't shouted out enough. Um just because the songs themselves are so damn good, but that's like one of the most immaculately produced and mixed and just sounding things ever put to wax. Like a I want to. I want to. I want to put that uh, sound into a, a brew of some sort, and just and just drink it. I want it Consume. inside of me, in my blood. <laughs> yeah, it it, it, it is. Yeah, it, it's obviously made all the more poignant um, by Lane Staley's passing, and and that's something I, I guess is intangibly tied to it but i cannot help but get the feeling that even if that had not happened there's really so much just like despondency in this record that that it still would have the same effect i think um yeah it really does sound like rock bottom and it's um it's it's just unbelievable how beautiful it is for how close it gets to the lowest uh, a person can feel and and puts that onto a record um okay so what else am i going to talk about uh, i'll also shout out i listened to um uh, prince's album controversy yeah uh, i love prince that. who doesn't love prince prince is great um prince. obviously but um but obviously people are drawn to records like Purple Rain and Sign of the Times, uh, which are indisputable masterpieces. Anyone who tells you they're not, cut them out of your life. <laughs> um, but Prince's early records have some incredible shit on them, even if they're not as, um, you know, stylistically um, cohesive of, of, an, of individual packages as the, the, the big ones. Uh, but Controversy is a really interesting record because it is Prince's political album. Um, there are songs, multiple songs in this record where he kind of addresses Ronald Reagan directly. <laughs> um, and and the, he also kind of ties, obviously Prince's whole deal is sex. He's a sex god. Um, and there are, and I think there is may, maybe his greatest sex anthem ever is on this record which is do me baby uh which is maybe my favorite prince song even actually if i think about it but then i'll probably go back and listen to sign of the times and change my mind again but but um but yeah so you so you get these incredible like songs like do me baby where prince is literally having an orgasm for four <laughs> minutes straight in the back half of the song and screaming in tune 
Motherfucker can hard. scream in tune. Um, like you listen, I reckon if fucking James Brown heard this, he his cheeks would go red. He would be <laughs> embarrassed at the sounds that um, Prince makes uh, on this Not just album. because he's experiencing the musical equivalent of being nut on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's this album. This album is Prince basically just fucking bukakiing everyone. <laughs> Um, podcast out of context where you went it's, it's, it's it just be a allowed ring, to do that a ring that's of a statement that needs no context but yeah it, it's a credit to prince that he's able to have these incredible sex jams and also these songs that are kind of political but also kind of satirical uh and not have any of it kind of fall flat or feel um out of place or toothless like it's a very strong record that i think gets overlooked because on before you've got dirty mind which is a great album and after it you've got um 1999 which is iconic and this one kind of just gets a bit forgotten and so i wanted to shout it out because it's really fucking good the title track is amazing uh one of prince's best songs as well like i could be here all day talking about it um and what one more thing to shout out i guess um you know what? Actually, I'll leave it there. I listened to some other stuff. Oh no, I will mention in passing that I have, uh, in preparation for the segment we're about to start soon, I listened to every Foo Fighters record. Um, yeah. Uh, re-listened to the first two and then listened to the rest, which I had not heard, um, just to kind of give myself more of a kind of like an impulse decision. But I, but I always was interested in doing it because their music is so easy to listen to and and just kind of of immediate but also you can sort of paint a career arc um that i think kind of gets a little bit um not really even talked about but anyway i'm not going to talk about that now because we'll get into it when we review it but um but yeah i was doing that this week as well and you came to the correct conclusion on what the best one was Yes, and I'll mention that. Um, mm-hmm. What the fuck will I wait to mention that? The best one's Wasting Light, obviously. Fuck yes. <laughs> fuck yes. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah there it him. is. There it is. The boy. boy. Anyway, before we get into that, <laughs> though. <laughs> you just call it juicy? It's the problem. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty thick. It's Pro- two okay. LPs. It's yeah. fat. Good, solid PH. thing. Um, before we get into that, though, Laura, would you like to talk about anything that you have been listening to this week? Yes. Um, I have listened to a lot of shit the last... I mean, since I was here last time, but um, most of what I listen to, we are going to get to very soon. But um, I wanted to quickly shout out a fantastic post-punk-ish band called Do Nothing, which have two EPs out, which are fantastic. Um, a new one from a band I had never heard of called TV Priest. Uh, I can't remember the album, album title, but that was a very good album. Um, also revisited Neptunian Maximalism's Eons, which is yes. still just the yes. best thing I've ever heard. Yes, that um, amazing album. Yeah. A quick shout out to Asterisk's Dogma One, which is just the best thing I've ever heard, really. It's 14 minutes and it's just Mr. Bungle and Phantomas in a uh, meat grinder. So that's that. Yeah. Oh. I know also, yeah. wasn't Laura. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't there something else that you gave a re listen to? Oh, yeah. Recently? Fucking cause. Really, uh, well, really listen. I don't know about really listen, and this might not even be what you're talking about. But I listened to Cardiacs. <laughs> Is that where we're going? No. I was thinking of something else. <laughs> okay, I think okay. more than I think of the same thing. I, I was thinking yeah. of some uh-huh. kind of uh, some kind of audio uh, expressway. Sonic Highways. Yes. Yeah. The redemption oh, God, episode. Fake. I, I have had no fucking idea what any of you were talking about. And I was just yeah. like, what is Same. happening? But it's good you reminded me because before we get to Sonic Highways, which we will get to later, but um, Cardiacs. Cardiacs. Fucking Christ. Mm. Jesus Christ. Sing to God is Jesus Christ. That's all I'll say. He'll cover it soon. <laughs> But yeah, that is it's true. very, very good. I know also, uh, Laura, that you, because you've said to me that you've been listening to a bit of Jason Isbell this week too. 
I thought maybe you'd want well, to shout yeah. that out. Yeah. I thank you for reminding me of the things I, I've listened I saw to. you tweet about reunions. <laughs> now I remember. Yeah, reunions. Yes. Reunions, yeah. Reunions. And I will get to every single all of them because just I will probably listen to all of them with my mom because she also loved it. Which is wholesome stuff. But yeah. I think that's it. Apart right. from like everything, everything, which is like every week. <laughs> yeah, some, some, thing, every week. some things go without saying. Yeah. Punisher. Um, <laughs> Damn. I have listened to Punisher once this year. I will have you know. Once. Only this year. once. Wow. Only once. Cancelled. That's yeah. That's me. No, uh, boy, you boy can- genius gonna be coming after you. Me. Went cancelled, and my mind was going. I am so happy for you. That's <laughs> where my mind went too. You I must, was like, you must well, be on the upswing. podcast. <laughs> don't don't worry. I've been listening to Death Consciousness almost daily, so that's worse. <laughs> oh dear. Equivalent that's, exchange. That's uh. <laughs> Man. All right. also. Speaking or, or of Teka. pain, yes. not really. But... Yeah, or Yes, we. Uh, I. I, I yeah. will. We might as well shout this out. Um, Laura has been going through the discography of Orteca, and I've been kind of joining her for each album listen. So that's been lots of fun. But we with a mutual friend. Yeah, with our with our mutual friend, shout out to Golf Clap. Um, <laughs> she'll appreciate that. Um, yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, I love the I love the actual golf clips in the chat. Great, great stuff. Let's move on to our first uh, album proper that we're going to be reviewing today. Um, the and I'm doing this, I guess, because Jake's frozen. Um, yeah. Uh, but but it is the Foo Fighters with their tenth, I believe, LP, yep. um, "Medicine at Midnight." It only seems fitting that I should turn to Morgan, I think, to introduce this. Uh, obviously the Foo Fighters don't need a whole heck of a lot of context, but if you want, you can, if you want to sort of speak about the album first, if you like. Um, yeah, I think it's somewhat important to contextualize this record. Um, uh, partially because it is their 10th and that implies a certain amount of, uh, you know, chutzpah. Um, but this is, uh, by a significant margin, the shortest Foo Fighters record to date. Um, Dave Grohl has described it as just their sort of Saturday night party album, um, which is definitely sort of the vibe that translates to some that translates to some degree. Um, although I would argue that really is maybe only two Foo Fighters records that wouldn't. Uh, be well described as a Saturday night party album, but you know. So I, I suppose I'll just jump right in. It's uh, it's uh, just a big old mixed bag. Um, I have a lot of conflicting thoughts about this here album, Medicine at Midnight. Um, I think it the the first track, Making a Fire, is one of the most purely fun things that they've made since wasting light easily in the past decade um the the sort of the choice to use a sort of chorus vocal background i think was really exciting for them within the context of who Foo fighters are um and it definitely implies a sort of uh, uh branching out sonically for them um but yeah it's it's mainly just a lot of fun just a total fucking jam after that comes uh shame shame which was the lead single i think released in november of last year somewhere around there um and it's strange it is a strange song for them um i've come to enjoy it quite a bit mostly because i think i feel like it's one of those songs where you get to the chorus or a bridge or whatever and it sort of just kind of unlocks the whole thing for you um because i th- I, th- I think the verses on it are just kind of eh. uh, it has a really captivating beat right out of the track there's a sort of really strange like sort of finger snapping floor stomping syncopation thing that they're doing in confluence with the drums um 
but yeah, the chorus just opens the whole thing uh, wide, and it just. I don't know. It's it's a really interesting track, and I think it's a real grower. Um, but I have ultimately come to like it a lot. Um, Cloud Spotter is, uh, I would describe it as misguided. Um, it's a it's a decent riff. Um, it's basically just as to imply up. it is indeed guided. <laughs> um, it's basically a straight up disco rock track. Um, which is a choice that they made. It's, but the, its biggest problem is it's just kind of boring and kind of meandering and it, and it never really feels like it gets where it's going. It's just kind of a song. It is present. It is filler on an art, on a 34 minute album, which is not not ideal 36 minute whatever um and we get to other lead single waiting on a war which um dave's talked a little bit about this in some interviews um the thematically it's about him sort of growing up in the reagan cold war years when he essentially thought he was facing complete oblivion every other day because that's the sort of mindset that the late Cold War instilled in people. Um, this, the, uh, while that sort of thematic idea I think is pretty interesting to explore, um, again, the song is just kind of meandering and not particularly interesting. I think once the, the drums come in and sort of fill it out a little bit and the song does get a lot better as it goes along I think especially by the end of it when it's sort of like the last minute of it where it just becomes a full on rock song I think that part of it's really cool I think it sort of really fills itself out as it goes along and it builds on what it established but I think here we, we come across a really strange thing that affects most of the album and affected a lot of the last album and it's uh, similarly strange but uh, very much sonically different ways that it just is mixed and produced really weirdly um, that was the biggest hampering for the for concrete and gold I think is just that even like the great songs in there are just kind of they sound of just a hair compressed you know and sometimes they don't sound a hair compressed they they sometimes sound compressed all the shit and it just doesn't it sounds bad i, um, I think i can actually t um give a little bit of context to this and touch on this a little bit um uh i think it dovetails to what you're saying nicely so i might as well just enter it now uh is that this record and Concrete and Gold were both produced by Greg Kirsten, Greg Kirsten. who is a pop producer uh, and is produced oh, for um, artists such as Adele, Sia, yeah. uh, Kelly Clarkson, Halsey, Beck, Paul McCartney, Lily Allen. Um, and so that's a clear aesthetic decision that's been made in terms of wanting to make their sound feel, I guess, more vital. Um, but yeah, I won't. Temporary. I'll, I'll stop there because it's not my turn to review it. But I think that is probably part the big the reason why um, it feels so strange for the Foo Fighters. Yeah, um, I definitely think it's a lot more interesting throughout this record um, than it is throughout Concrete and Gold. Just because I think Concrete and Gold's most interesting production choices when it just sounds like shit um but i i think it's just very much a mixed bag on medicine at midnight because it either i think really enhances songs like making a fire where they're just sort of sort of making a sort of bold new entrance into the stylistic choices that they're making or it's just waiting on a war where it feels a little misguided um or cloud spotter where it just sounds like nothing um, yeah, after that is the title track, uh, Medicine at Midnight, which I think somewhat similar to Cloud Spotter doesn't sound like a whole lot. Um, 
I just can't say I find much of it very interesting. Um, sort of a mid-tempo jam sort of feel that they're going for, and it's just, I don't know. I, I, there's nothing about it that I find to be captivating all that much. Um, I, I really like the bass work. I think one of the biggest pluses to this uh, album is uh, Nate Mendel, formerly of Sunny Day Real Estate, um, huh. on the bass, who has been with Foo Fighters since after the first record. I um, think the second longest standing member overall. But yeah, I, th I think he is, forms the backbone for a lot of these songs and often sort of provides the most interesting core component of them, which is, I think is great because it highlights just how talented Mendel really is and how essential he's been to this band for getting on to 30 years now. Um, and it's glad to see him shine a bit. I just wish it was in a lot more interesting framework. After that, we have No Son of Mine, which is a sort of like really hard rocking, uh, almost sort of speed metal at times influenced track. Um, that is unfortunately just really marred by weird Greg Kirsten E production. Mm. Um, having seen Foo Fighters live, I can uh, I can rest assured knowing that uh, this track will kick so much ass live, especially when, as Dave said, he would like to open shows with it now. Um, and that just sounds fantastic. Hopefully we get a live cut, uh, maybe a live album at some point afterwards um, when they're able to get to touring again for this song, just so I can hear it when it's not completely fucked over by Greg Kirsten yeah. Holding Poison I think is maybe the most utterly forgettable track here just again firmly middle of the road Foo Fighters fair with again some strange production choices um, Chasing Birds I think is a really lovely acoustic track um, serves as the penultimate moment on the album and gives a sort of moment to breathe for the Saturday night party jam thing that the they've been going for throughout the whole album. But it's also, you know, I can't help but feel that it would be a pretty middling track on most other Foo Fighters albums. Like on even like Echo Silence, Patience and Grace, this would be like really just not something that stands out in your mind at all, unfortunately. But I think the I think the lyrics are pretty interesting as well. I think they deal with addiction to some degree, um, which is certainly something that Dave has a lot of experience with uh, secondhand, um, because I think he he decided to stop doing drugs at like twenty or twenty one years old and hasn't done them since. Uh, but uh, drummer Taylor Hawkins. Uh, nearly died of a heroin overdose on the There's Nothing Left to Lose tour, I think. Um, so this is, is definitely material that he has done a lot of living with, and it's cool to see it explored here. But this brings us to the last track on the album, Love Dies Young, which is the absolute head and shoulders highlight for me. Um, I think this is where the production choices really shine i think there's a really nice almost sort of killers on hot fuss-esque sort of yeah uh, sound that they're creating especially with the the chorus on the lead line um it's like yeah it's it's another sort of 80s rock track influenced 80s influenced rock track rather um but that sort of almost Springsteen-y, rootsy Americana look is one that uh, the Foo really wears well, I think. And I would love to have an album of songs that just sound like this afterwards. Um, because I really love this track on like what I plan to do now that I've, uh, once I've listened to this album and after I'll probably revisit In Your Honor, um, I'll make a big giant best of Foo Fighters playlist and just dump stuff in there 
and Love Dies Young is going to be the first thing from Medicine at Midnight that goes in that playlist. Um, I think it's, along with Making a Fire, is the only track that really gets at the sort of consistent uh, Saturday night party album thing they were going for. Um, that is not only uh, not hurt by the production style, but actively enhanced by it. Um, but yeah, that's that's the album. It's uh, confused and confusing, um, not without its moments. It definitely has those, but I find it to be just wildly inconsistent, even on a minute by minute basis to some degree. Um, overall, I come away with positive feelings, but I, I, th I think they need to stop working with Greg Kirsten as step one. Um, step two is maybe sort of explore some of the inclinations they have here, but um, make them more focused. Like we don't need a cloud spotter on the next album. Um, disco is not really something that the Foo Fighters need to be exploring, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a thing. Yeah, leave the disco exploration to King Gizzard. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm but sure yeah. that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I um. Yep. I want to. I basically can echo most of what Morgan says. Although, I think I do ultimately come away a little more negatively, um, than he does. Um, but really, that is the trend with you. <laughs> just looking at your ratings for all of their albums, it's like a point or two below me typically. Yeah, but um, I also want to say, and I might catch a little bit of flack from this just for the podcast and generally, um, but building on the Killers comparison, I want to say that to me, those two bands, though the Killers have done it with a much shorter discography, kind of have a similar arc. Um, and I say this as a person who will give, give light defenses of um, Killers albums that um, others will happily shit on. Um, and to me... I will not... I yeah, will not no, fear be enough. shitting on them. <laughs> to me, this is kind of like their wonderful, wonderful, where you kind of, you pivot your, it, it, where, this in, con in conjunction with Concrete and Gold, I guess, where you're kind of pivoting away from a more like classically aggressive sound into something that's a little kind of pivoting back towards some of the pop inclinations that you sort of made your name with. Um in terms of the songwriting if not the, if not the sound um and that unfortunately is not a compliment because i think that wonderful wonderful is the worst um killers album mm. and i you, think you would be right about that you and i think correct. that um this and concrete and gold i feel about the same about each which is to say that i think that they're bad albums not terrible certainly with highlights uh i think that the record i have to concur with morgan so i think that the record starts really strongly uh with making a fire uh it's a great energetic opener with a scuzzed out guitar sound i think that actually the way that the guitar is produced here uh, is really great and, and suits the song uh, especially in conjunction with the catchy na 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 vocals, uh, it gives it's a really kind of nice shining track that has a kind of garagey feel as well, and I just really dig it. Um, uh, I was thinking about this yesterday, just because I was like thinking about um, the still thinking about uh, even though I wasn't here for it last week, the Stephen Wilson album, and I was thinking about how that record incorporates kind of like na 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 sort of um, chorus chorus the additional vocals and it, the reason it doesn't work on that record is because they feel really hokey and cheesy in a way that seems to be in conflict with the self-seriousness of it of the rest of the album whereas there's a total awareness of the frivolity of what the foos are going for on this record like the whole thing about it being a saturday night party album they're embracing that they don't have pretensions about what their music is and as a result, uh, when the songwriting is there and when they're able to bring the hooks to the fore, um, it's really, you know, captivating. And it, it, it's simple, but it, has, it doesn't matter that it's simple because it has a kind of catchiness and a kind of like 
punch to it. And I think that um, Making a Fire really has that. And I also quite like the spacious and stilted groove of Shame Shame. I, I don't think it's quite as successful of a song overall as the opening track. Um, for example, when Dave starts crooning and the groove drops out and it gets a little bit sort of denser, um, then I kind of lose interest a little bit because it's the kind of spaciousness of it that I think is what makes it interesting. Um, but still overall, um, pretty positive on that song too. And yeah, and then I think from that point on, the record really does take a, a, a noticeable dive. Um, I have to concur that Cloud Spotter um, is, is a not a good song. Um, production decisions aside, at the core, and this is a, an issue I think that most of the songs on the record have, it's just underwritten. Uh, and it, it doesn't do very much um, to distinguish itself as an as a piece of as a song in and on its own uh it reminds me more of the kind of trashy deep cuts on some of their less successful records um and and much like basically anything in the midsection of concrete and gold i will not remember this song um for very long i, mean, I can't remember it right now um um, the dynamics here are still not terrible. Like I, I kind of do enjoy the sort of off kilter sounds you can sort of hear. I think there was a decision, a purposeful decision to kind of include more sort of um, studio sounds and give it a bit more of a kind of rough around the edges feel. And I think that um, benefits the record because it, whereas with something like concrete and, and gold, it just feels really kind of like stale. Whereas here, at least there's a little bit more life to it. Um, um, but yeah, the, I just so many of these songs just really don't stick the landing. Um, you And what will often happen um, with the Foos, and, and I'll, I'll touch, I guess I'll sort of talk about briefly my experience listening to their discography this week. I was pleasantly surprised um, how much of it I actually enjoyed. Um, In Your Honor, particularly, I think is a really underrated album, and so is Sonic Highways as well. Um, and those records really, yeah. those records really have um, this kind of immediacy to them and this kind of grit and urgency even when you're talking about the second disc of in your honor which is sort of the softer acoustic cuts there's still a sense that like there's an there's still a sense with dave that he needs to make this music and 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 sonic highways has got the same kind of feel as well um but but with something like medicine at midnight and with something like the deep cuts on concrete and gold or one by one for instance the 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 method seems to be that dave um will kick around and and write a pretty semi-decent riff um and they'll, he'll kind of loop that riff at the start of the song to kind of get you really hooked into the song like oh yeah this sounds this is you know grabbing my attention and then just nothing notable will happen and it's like, yeah, there was potential here. <laughs> what happened? Um, um, so I think where medicine benefits is that it can fall back a little bit on some of the production trickery to kind of give a sense of scale to the songs. Um, so that on one casual listen, it sounds halfway decent, but when you kind of try to inspect it more closely, it kind of collapses. Um, I do have to say that... Um, Unfortunately, I found uh, no son of mine to be uh, very dull uh, and just, again, underwritten is the word I keep coming back to. Uh, it's very repetitive, and it, and I guess Morgan's comment about um, it being a, it probably sounding amazing live does kind of get to the heart of I think where, where Foo Fighters' strengths lie. They're a band that can be incredibly aggressive and incredibly hard hitting, and they can really get you going. But um, when you're making albums and you're trying to do this thing from album to album where you're constantly trying to progress your sound or show different shades to your sound, but you have one particular strength, um, which is in their case, just being hard hitting and getting you up and going, then there can be a conflict between what you're really good at and the, the need to 
advance or be different or not remain kind of creatively stale. And some bands can pull off those shifts and some bands just have less luck doing it. And I imagine these songs will all universally sound better live. Um, uh, even the songs that I think do benefit from the production uh, will, I imagine, just sound better live because they will have that a greater impact, which is what they need. Um, and and yeah, it's just um, it's just a shame. Ultimately, it's it, this album and Concrete and Gold both feel like wasted potential. And I was having so much fun um, moving through each of the Foo's records that it that I hate to say that does feel like creatively in terms of. Um, continuing to sound fresh and invigorated and actually, you know, excited about making music, it's difficult to hear that in this record or the last one. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go just because I broadly agree with everyone who's come before and I don't have too much to say. So I'm just going to get myself over with now in the, hmm, where to begin on this record is, is hard. Um, because I have listened to it many times now, and I've never not found it incandescently dull. Um, even with highlights like the opening two tracks, uh, I agree that the mixing is a real problem. It is incredibly overly compressed, and it means that when they have a good idea or a good hook, and, and I'll say this now, there is not a single Foo Fighters song I have heard that doesn't have a good idea in it. Um, but in so many of these songs, uh, they are not developed upon. They are left to carry the song. Um, even with the uh, the opener of the of the album, uh, "Making a Fire," I think about this song and, and yeah, it's a highlight on this album. But when I compare it to other classic Foo Fighters openers, like uh, "This Is a Call," "Stacked Actors," "All My Life," "The Pretender," or "Bridges Burning," some of my personal favorites, um, it just doesn't compare. And part of it is that. Um, those are songs with much fuller EQs and much fuller writing that let the good ideas really fly. Um, for me, the only song on this album that really works uh, is Love is, is Love Dies Young, the, the closer. But for so much of it, even with the um, sort of uh, stylistically divergent touches on the production, it only sounded to me like... Uh, if I was to hire Dave Grohl to write backing music for a Spotify premium advert. Um, and and I, I want more from, from my Foo Fighters. These are a band I, I've, that have been a core part of my musical identity for going on a decade now. Um, and I want them to like um, work with Steve Albini and make a great. Yeah, Steve Albini album. would be great Fuck. for them or something. Like. Fuck. Well, especially when you think about like the, the real sort of problem with a lot of what they've been doing is uh, a, a lack of production that understands the appeal of the Food Fighters. And then you look at Steve Albini's back catalogue and the albums he's produced. Um, even like even like Butch Vig's production on Nevermind would suit this album much more. Um, well, and I Butch think Vig did produce their best album. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, yeah. And their best go. sounding album. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it, it just, hmm. I know, I know that Dave can do better, and it's not like he's out of ideas because the ideas are here. They he just has failed to push them to the point where they are full, I suppose, and. It's 36 minutes long. It's, it's a brisk album. Not the briskest, but it's brisk. And when you're boring me with a 36 minute long album, I'm, I'm wondering what, what, what are you doing that, that's interesting? Um, because you've made this short as a creative choice, I assume. So it's, it's the question of, are you trying to be punchy or do you just not have enough ideas to push it up to 40 minutes? Um, and I would fall on the latter answer there. Dave, you can do better. This is, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed because I know you can do better than this. Well, and please uh, do better than be, this in future. In fairness, I do think that the record's um, length is one of its greatest strengths, not just because it lacks ideas, but because the and it's like with sonic highways as well that song that records only eight songs i guess nine if you count the fact that the fourth song is split in two but it just kind of 
it, it feels really, really punchy, and it feels like we have we've culled this the best ideas, and we're just gonna deliver them to you one after another. Um, and it's like they were kind of trying to use that sort of approach yeah. here with Absolutely. the structure of the record, but um, it didn't necessarily. Work. Yeah, I, I wish the album felt like that to me. I wish that it had the, even though I like Sonic Highways less than you two, I wish it had had the effect that album does have of being punchy and, and quick. And like, No Son of Mine will be great live, but that kind of speaks to the fact that it, it, it's not quite delivering on the record to me. Yeah, um, I really hate to to beat the proverbial dead horse, but um, I'm really just kind. Of, if anything, I am stuck in the middle of where everyone else is, which is also being stuck in the very middle. <laughs> and like, I don't, I can't really contribute or have much to say here, just because I'm also like, I'm I'm not as store. Like, I only really got into Foo Fighters last year when I listened to uh, or no, not last year, year before last, the last year of life didn't happen. Um, two years ago when I heard uh, the color and the shape for the first time and then just sort of like, all right, I'll listen to all of these. And, you know, so I don't have a, like a particularly storied past with them or anything, but I was just sort of like surprised because the only exposure I'd had to Foo Fighters was through the singles. And it's like, well, you know, their singles really don't represent them as a band. Like half the shit on color and shape is just, just goes fucking hard. <laughs> it's like, that's it's why, not every song's not hero. That's why I get pissed off a little bit because I keep multiple times I've heard Foo Fighters be referred to as a singles band. No. Disgusting. Lies. Lies. Disgusting. No. Disgusting. That's just, no, that actually makes me like kind of upset. Like not to say the singles are bad. I'm just saying they're, they're often, at least like, especially with their later shit, not the case. Um, but I listened to this and honestly, uh, I, I co-signed a lot of what Serge just said. It's, it's under 40 minutes and it was a drag. Like I, I was able to process the Black Country New Road record better because that is an album that's like five minutes longer than this, but feels five minutes shorter. And this, on the other hand, is just, it's so woefully inconsistent. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that it's like, they're trying to do a really weird thing where they're sort of like looping back onto like all of the problems that maybe like individual albums of their recent stuff have had. Cause it's like, they're trying to be like, I feel like there's a lot more garaginess on this album. Like it's calling back a lot to wasting life uh, wasting light. Um, but it also is like, like the Foo Fighters are a big band now. They, they got a lot of shit going on in them. Don't they have three guitarists at this point or something? Something yep. fucking ridiculous. Yeah, they have this really fucking loud sound and they're just compressing it. And it's like, you don't get the best of either world. And it leaves you in a really precarious situation, especially when it's like, like again, Sarah just sort of alluded to the fact that it's like it's not like the ideas aren't here. They're they're clearly trying something. Like this is them sort of exercising a bit more. Like it's almost like a total creative opposition to Concrete and Gold, which I do like. I, I like that album. I just think it's them just sort of resting on their laurels and sort of coasting it, like doing things that they they they've done well and are doing well. But this, on the other hand, is like them trying more, but it also just suffers more than it's helped by it. Like. I, I really, I, I think the record strong, or like it, it ends and begins very strongly, but uh, I cannot get into Shame Shame. It, it really just hasn't grown. It's a very clumsy song, a very strange mid-tempo thing. And I just can't really get into it. It's sort of impenetrable. And already I'm just kind of like flailing for something to latch onto. And then immediately Cloud Spotter comes in and I'm just like, okay, all right, let's, can, no no we don't need to do this and then like it, it picks up a tiny bit in the sense that i like i don't dislike waiting on a war um I, I think the title track's fine and uh no son of mine like you know it's it's harder than the songs before it so it sticks out um holding poison is a song that like man fucking hold me at gunpoint i can't tell you what i, I don't know what's here man i've heard this album almost four full times and i still what does this song sound like? Um, Chasing Birds and Love's Di Love Dies Young are, <laughs> it's where the album really picks up steam. 
uh it's just like a really heartfelt song with chasing birds like it's it sort of stops with all like the 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 mix is just so fucking claustrophobic they're just trying to fit so much shit into this and it's so compressed and weird and muddy and then chasing birds kind of gives you a little freedom from all that and then love dies young comes on it's just like yeah morgan you're right i really do want a song an album of songs like this and Eh, I, I just hate that the first time that I that I get to like open up with a Foo Fighters album and talk about this band that I really really like, with what is at least handily my by my own assessment handily their weakest album. Not an album I would call bad by any stretch of the imagination because it's it doesn't have enough lasting impact to be bad. It just sort of evaporates. It vanishes. I, I have no reason to revisit this when I have albums like Wasting Light, which is just this, but demonstrably better. So it, it's just a very awkward, very kind of flimsy thing. It doesn't make me fear for the future of the band. If anything, it's like, well, you know, I was worried that if like Concrete and Gold might have been them being like, we're just going to pigeonhole ourselves for the rest of our career and just do this over and over again, which I didn't want. So this proves they've got some ideas. I just want them to be bet better, better ideas yeah. next yeah, time. I, I think this is just kind of what happens with lots of legacy rock acts who have really have massive success and re- have really established themselves. Um, I think U2 is another great example where it's like um, the, the extent to which you reinvent or do something different or progress or whatever. And it's never really necessary. Like you don't need to do anything Um new to survive as a band you're big enough to just continue touring for the rest of your lives until you want to retire so the extent to which you even make records or the the extent to which you make records is related to the extent to which you still want to tour um and because a record is an excuse for a tour basically um and and so like the extent to which they want to reinvent themselves or or explore new ideas is you know it's kind of like when it's on a whim basically it's 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 whatever they're feeling like they don't need to do any of this they could they could do you know they're they're successful enough to just kind of like um at this point they could just like wait until the 10th anniversary of of every one of their other albums and just do a tour on that but like you do get into this you should um bring up the fact that uh, at this point they make records at all because this is like a fairly old record to be released now most i think almost all of it was recorded before the uh, lockdown started um and they wanted to wait until the lockdown had ended to release it yeah uh, and, and we're gonna get a lot of that this year i think we're gonna get a lot of records that were recorded at some point uh in like probably in an early last year um and they're just pushed back because of it's exactly the situation with Kendrick Lamar right now, the biggest artist in the world, yeah. maybe, who has recorded an album. I don't think anyone is really doubting that the album exists, but is just not releasing it because um, it's not a time to capitalize on a major album release. Um, so yeah, artists are pushing back records as much as they can. Um, and yeah, I, I really hope that the Foos get to tour this, but um, I don't, see it really as anything other than one engaging in um dave and co's whims in terms of uh, wanting to explore because they're you know in a, in a situation where they're comfortable enough to be able to do that and also just wanting to tour yeah first of their records that just feels largely inessential like i don't think all of them are great by any means but like i can make a case for yeah well see basically any gold, of them cold Creek and gold was the first one i didn't bother with um and this one is worth bothering with but it's not worth going back to for me mm, yeah fair enough yeah anyway we have two people who haven't talked about it yet yes, yes. yes. i mean everything everyone has said basically i love shame shame it was the most excited i've been for Foo fighters in years and then the album happened um (laughs) but you know no but yeah love dice young is great more of that making a fire i actually can't stand (laughs) Um, (laughs) but the more i listen to it but it's mostly the 
the the chorus of like it it's it, it i guess it's what people feel listening to like something like simulation theory or like these bands trying to like incorporate the stadium woes uh but it's just not hitting for me but yeah it's it's fine it's few fighters it's 2021 it's you know yeah also so sorry, to, to sorry, like uh, yeah sorry to get back on this again i just keep thinking of a different thing that i've that i've been wanting to express that i've forgotten but like my the larger point with my thing about Foo Fighters being massively successful is that they don't need to necessarily try for radio success with each record anymore. Yeah. I mean, like they don't, they could do something like work with not necessarily Steve Albini, but a Steve Albini type recorder. They could make something grittier because they are still successful enough to be able to tour off the back of it. As long as they play <laughs> all the stuff that people love. Um, but I, so that's the thing. Like, I feel like they're at a place where they can really take risks and they're kind of, yeah taking the wrong kind of risks by getting down this weird pop route and i feel like a fucking boomer saying that but they're just not some bands can do that some rock bands Foo can't fighters aren't good anymore <laughs> some rock bands can do that some rock Make bands Foo can fighters kind of great again go in that pop <laughs> route, but, but i mean it just yeah the foos don't wear it well at this point they they need a moment moment shape. just said like <laughs> need a moment that's the fan base. We got it. No, just kidding. Um, a fucking drum machine on here. What are you fucking stupid? <laughs> no, no Swedish, Swedish songwriters. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well done. <laughs> August, August is, uh, August is manifesting <laughs> Foo Fighters' father of all right now. Well, I, I would shake hands with Morgan if we were I, in the room together. Father of all. I, I would, if August is manifesting Foo Fighter, Foo Fooder of all, I would kill him before he finished. I just said that joke, but okay. There's only great jokes get only, stolen. I didn't hear you. Everybody was talking at once. Yeah. It happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would kill him before he finished. The world <laughs> can't take another disaster of that scale. Honestly, with the career trajectory that the Foos have had at this point, I am all but certain their next record will be a at least an attempt at a wake, Wasting Light style rebound from this. Just because they're the kind of band that will never stay trying to do the same thing for too long. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine them trying to make another pop record after this. Just because Tyler, well, the then, tone in your then, voice just indicated that you were about to say they're going to make a father of all, and no, I was going no. to kill you. No, I'm not saying their next was record. Headed. I'm not saying yeah. their next no, record will be wasting light level good, but it just the no, way that, that Dave yeah. Grohl's mind works, the he's way he's smart, like you know. wanting to shift from record to record, I can only see him pivoting. Yeah, yeah maybe Love Die song is like. Well, what we're peak. getting at, what we're getting at here, yeah, is that Dave Grohl Hopefully. is a smart man, yeah, and Billy Joe Armstrong is a stupid man. Yep. <laughs> yes. He's Thank you, Joe. Dave could do Dookie if he wanted to. He'll never want to, but he could. But Billy Joel could never do like the color of the show. Who the fuck it, is he... B- Billy Joel? Yeah, I love him. <laughs> I want I, I want Billy Joel's wasting light. That'll be That's when he works else. at the grocery store. <laughs> Power cords. <laughs> Good night, Saigon uh rap metal cover. I, I, I want Billy Joel's like early Tom White style piano man cover of Monkey Ranch. Yes, piano today. man. <laughs> <laughs> a I got the show. Who drops I got the piano on people. Thank you. Let's move on <laughs> to whatever we were getting on to. Laura, did you even finish your review? <laughs> I mean, it's Foo Fighters. It's 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 decent to put on, and then it's out of your mind. The name. Well, no, well, okay. This, this, record... this album, this record is. I got a I got a poll quote for you. This record's yeah. more like oof fighters. God, I, I was jamming with I, I was jamming Go. with Jake and there was some and I was trying to describe the record and I was like, you know, it's 36 minutes of arguably Thank rock you for music. Coming, Laura. Uh, and... <laughs> oh, yes. That's my favorite ah! quote. <laughs> Stealing yeah. my bit now. 
<laughs> 37 minutes of arguably rock music. Yep. Oh, God. <sighs> there are harmonies, I guess. Um, well, look, look, at this point in the review, I think we are in dire need of a counterpoint to all of our feelings. And of course, we must turn to August for this undeniable <laughs> counterpoint that we're about to get. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're uh, going to my, my, just my counterpoint agree completely. Is uh, uh, this, so they, they've already got a, a record called uh, Wasting Light. This should be Wasting Time. Hey, uh, hey. Yeah. What, what immediately leaps out to me about oh. this on like uh, tracks like uh, Making a Fire is that a uh, production is just the worst thing of all time. Uh, it sounds completely brick walled, compressed to shit. And it doesn't help that there's just way too much going on here, as was pointed out by Jake. Like, we've got three guitar players, uh, bass, drums, hand claps, keyboards, female choral vocals, all on this one song. <laughs> hand claps. <laughs> yeah. The way you said that was like, that was a specific person who was employed by the band for yeah. that purpose. Like, well, well, I'm, Greg, I'm gonna, I do, our hand I do, claps I do. guy left the band. We need to replace our hand claps guy. Uh, yeah. My name's Greg. I do hand claps for the Foo Fighters. Some kind of monster, <laughs> except it's Metallica trying to find a new hand claps player. It, it, it's a minimum wage job. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it, it you, just... I would delete this. I, I think the uh, I think the Albini comparison, the Albini kind of references is a good one because they're really in need of someone, some figure who can just say, enough is enough. We've done too much on this track. It, it just needs, it's in desperate need of being like stripped down, pulled back from this just overpowering sound that is yeah. not properly conveyed on like you think about what Seath Albini did with the Pixies right um Uh, I would I would go much even even much more recent than that I would say they need someone who can do what Steve Albini did with Cloud Nothing's Attack on Memory right right yeah a just really punchy 35 minutes and it just falls to the wall sure Um, I was just thinking about the Pixies because there is like a through line with that band to yeah. the Foo Fighters. It's yeah, not even no. like, when I said Albania, I wouldn't, I didn't mean like Steve Albania specifically. No, I, I, know what, I know what you mean though. But like it, it just needs that to be, kind of person. Yeah, someone who has a huge name so that working with them will immediately create a narrative for the record. Mm-hmm. And also someone who won't be a yes man, which I think is what August was saying. Someone yeah, who, yeah, that's, who will that's just like... Brian Eno. <laughs> I mean, fucking yeah... <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd listen to that record. It would be interesting ambient, at the very least. Make Foo Fighters ambient again. No, uh, um, I, I think what um, she was saying was like doing what Eno did for Coldplay. Um, no, I know. I, probably, I was fucking with you. Probably not the best fit for Foo Fighters, but you know, it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, I mean, I, I will say the biggest compliment this record has is I think Dave Grohl having such a a, a great vocal presence means this the experience is never boring even if it is frustrating at points I, i'm never like just completely tuned out there's always like a little bit i can latch on to uh and it's it's at its very best i think when it's really stripped back and the production is eased up upon the problem is those moments aren't exactly uh all that memorable uh yeah as a whole it's just and and that's really just the thing it's just unfortunately mild unfortunately not all that memorable or particularly exciting so needless to say i'm i'm not really a fan but it's so short and inoffensive that like i I don't hate it per se it's just Mm. not great okay well um if there's nothing else to add let's uh move into uh, favorite tracks and scores seeing as tyler is away at the moment we'll go in a normal jansen t order yeah. okay uh my three favorite songs which uh real this was a real uh tough thing because it's like yeah it's making a fire and love dies young what's the third one uh 
the title track. Sure. Why not? Uh, least favorite? Uh, yeah, I gotta go Cloud Spotter, and I give it a five. Fair enough. Uh, August. Yeah, favorites, I don't care. Uh, least favorites, um, I don't know. Cloud Spotter's dumb. Uh, Chasing Birds was kind of funny because the chorus of it sounded like he was saying Jason Burns. Uh, fucking four, I don't care. It's not great. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's Jason Burns. You're hilarious. I know. I bring the laughs. <laughs> I don't know why um, I have the right to say that, because I don't. You um, don't. Absolutely no. not. <laughs> anyway, Morgan, it's your go. Uh, Love Dies Young, Making a Fire, Shame, Shame, uh, Least Favorite Cloud Spotter, fucking five. All right, so that's me. Um, I was expecting more solidarity in the below five department. Um, so We can't change I'm, it now. No, I, I know. Um... So, Making a Fire, Chasing Birds, and Love Dies Young, my favorite tracks. My least favorite, probably Medicine at Midnight. Can I say that? I'm going to give this record. Hmm. See, I'm thinking about another rock band I love that made a bad record, uh, the latest Biffy Clyro record. And if I dislike this more, and I don't, so I'm going to give it a four. With, with all due respect, if you dislike this more than the uh, uh, celebration of uh, fucking whatever the hell it was called. Celebration of mediocrity. I, w- I would remove you from the I'm gonna, it, it. It's tight. I'm going to be honest. But anyway, it's tight. Let's go now. I mean, fuck it. Both records have, I would say, the same amount of highs and lows, except the difference Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Biffy record has lower lows. Um. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna give pretty good way to put it. My three favorite tracks are "Making a Fire," "Shame, Shame," and "Love Dies Young." Uh, least favorite, if I had to pick one, would probably be. I might even say "No Son of Mine." Uh, I am gonna give the album four out of ten. All right, Laura. My favorites are "Shame, Shame," "Love Dies Young," and eh, least favorite is. I I don't know any of them uh, <laughs> it's just so i i've listened to this five times and I, I i i only really remember shame shame and love dies young and it's uh, just five it's so not either yeah. way that it's just a five all right so it gives us a four and a half out of ten the only record of which is its equal <laughs> is kid cuddy man on the moon three the chosen oh dear tender, a tender that feels name. wrong yeah, yeah, a it does bit. feel wrong, doesn't it? Right? I mean, they're both yeah. pretty mid records. Yeah, no, that's kind of yeah. well, right. well. Speaking of mid E, um, <laughs> but no, I'm gonna go for <laughs> All right, so um, I told you I loved you, and f- I told you I loved you in front of the Foo Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a whole, that's a whole different song, right there. That that yeah. would completely change the tone of the song. You. Oh god, that was so I fucking funny. Up. Uh, in front of Foo Fighters. Okay, so now it's time to talk about um, our second main review for today, which is for a very interesting um, and highly buzzed new band, uh, British act called Black Country New Road. And what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll give a tiny bit of context, but I think Laura knows more about this band than me. So I'll leave it to her to properly introduce them. And if you want, Laura, you can kind of lead off with your thoughts on the record and whatever you want to say. Um, I think that would be appropriate, again, considering that you're our guest for, for and this if this segment is basically the reason why. Um, but yeah, so this is an interesting new uh, act from a very particular scene um, that I know already Laura is well acquainted with. Um, other bands that come to mind include obviously Black Midi, who, um, and I'll touch on this a little bit when I review it, but I think that this is a very different band um, to Black Midi, even if the roots are the same and they're a band shouted out by name uh, on this record. And another comparison, and the, another uh, act, up and coming act from a similar scene whose debut record we'll also be reviewing later in the year is Squid as well. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that too. Um, but yeah, so that is, all this is to say that it's kind of this 
it's difficult to, I think, uh, genre pigeonhole what this band does. If any of our listeners haven't heard them, um, we kind of the go to, I think, is post punk. And that's, um, a v- and I think that's an interesting term because to me, it's kind of become nebulous. We kind of use it to describe a lot of different bands that sound quite different really from each other Mm. uh we use it to describe this sort of sound that is this very kind of um guitar and bass rooted but uh not fast paced but kind of like more mid-paced or even slow with kind of drawling vocals uh and perhaps elliptical lyricism that is in in turns poetic and direct but strange um and that that's kind of like you can write a big list of all the archetypical post-punk features and black country new row will tick off a bunch of them but i don't really think this is a post-punk band uh and i don't but the problem i get at is that i then don't really know how to describe them i think if i was forced to use a genre label i would say art rock but even that feels i even i'm not even a big fan of that that label to be honest because post, again it's post rock it's oh, kind of nebulous and meaningless post rock i guess as well but basically i think this is to say that black country new road are very much their own thing and i'll touch on this a little bit when i review it as well and that there are definitely comparisons you can make to other acts in terms of shared similarities but the way in which the different elements that make this band what they are come together is incredibly singular i think I don't really think that they sound like any other band. Um, yeah. And just before we get into reviewing it, uh, there's one thing I want to highlight very quickly, which is they're called Black Country New Road. For um, those unfamiliar, Black Country is um, a very English term to do with an area of the Midlands um, and sort of North Wales as well. Um, that's sort of heavily industrial. If you think about places left behind by Thatcher, you're thinking of black country, sort of, uh, you're thinking of Wolverhampton, uh, Birmingham, uh, Staffordshire. Ah, uh, yes, Wolverhampton. I know it well. Uh, Wolverhampton. Fucking are, what? <laughs> a, w- a well-known town in <laughs> England, I suppose. But um, basically, um, industrial areas that sort of um, heavily industrialized, but also heavily agriculturalized in the Midlands sort of left behind by Thatcher. If you think about certain classical British sounds like post-punk, Black Country was a lot of the places those bands were coming out of. Um, and I'll come back to this when I review the record, but I think it's important going into it that this sound and this culture and this vibe of sort of downbeat post-Thatcherism is very important to a lot of the stories and yeah. sounds explored in this record. I mean, it's very much uh, a British tradition, um, post-punk, like at the heart of it. Like it's um, not exclusively, not to say that all the classic post-punk bands were exclusively British. That's certainly not the case, but um, it was obviously originated as a reaction to punk uh, Mm. inherently in the genre tag. Um, But more broadly, more broadly became, I think, a reaction to kind of rock music in general and specifically kind of popular rock music. Um, this idea of like um, these really kind of clean and heavy and driving sounds that were kind of quite accessible and hook driven and sort of stuff whereas this was an attempt to kind of like capture the uglier underside of (laughs) um, British art and culture or or like life where it's kind of more industrialized like you're talking about. That's absolutely right. Um, And and I think of um, one of the first bands I think of actually uh, is The Fall, uh, who I think Laura yeah. will probably touch on a little bit as well, because I know yeah. she's <laughs> familiar with them. <laughs> and and they, uh, I think, uh, particularly in their kind of golden 80s, early 80s era, uh, with records like Hex Induction Hour and This Nation Saving Grace, uh, kind of really cemented the irreverence, the sense of humor that you associate with a lot of post-punk um whereas the real originators and bands like joy division were famously kind of really morbid and dark but it's come to be a much more satirical and and edgy and um just less self-serious um sort of style of music and again i'll touch on that later but i want to cede the floor now to laura um laura take it away yeah um 
I guess I can start with an introduction of this band who came out of nowhere and debuted today on number four uh, in the charts uh, with the album. Uh, Probably number three, if not for the Foo Fighters. (laughs) Um, But yeah, they've been around for like three years at this point um, on the infamous Speedy Wonderground label, which is home to Black Midi and all of those people uh they were originally a band um called what is the name oh god i cannot remember what the name is nervous conditions which was all of them minus one uh, which split up because of um some serious allegations but they formed into black country new road with all of those people and then added a new member so they are seven people in an art rock fusion hell collective which just creates this unreal music um they have had like two singles out for like the better part of two years and they've already been a lot of places just named as one of the greatest bands a lot not like ever but one of the best promising acts um and basically they finally released their full-length album two weeks ago two weeks ago yeah it starts off with instrumental which is surprisingly instrumental (laughs) Um, (laughs) the lyrics to that uh, song are (laughs) (laughs) probably some shit that's a reference to like a two-year-old band or something slint um (laughs) um (laughs) but yeah uh, it starts off at this kind of terrifying roller coaster ride of just whirling rhythms and just you are thrown into this loop of just building and sinking rhythmic hell basically yeah as i said they have seven members they have two guitarists a drummer a bassist uh, a vocalist with your source of the guitarist a saxophonist and a vinyl violinist which um you can start to form some sort of picture for the sound from that, which infuses this post-punk hell with just, you know, seven 20-year-olds just battling for your attention. Yeah, I think Um, that's one of the things that I find most compelling about them as a band is that the the presence of a saxophonist and a violinist, it's not as though these those two are just there to add color i think every single person is contributing equally to every single one of these songs which is what makes them such a tight unit for a band that with us with the sheer size of of the band you would expect to uh you wouldn't necessarily expect that you would expect like like i think of like arcade fire for instance who do have all these different um who are like, it's like 12 people in that band and but it's all very <laughs> much about um the the, the core front man and front woman yeah. whereas um obviously um isaac wood is the vocalist and the most commanding presence on most of these songs but at the same time uh mm. i don't feel that he is driving all of them or any of them mm-hmm. entirely on his own yeah, no. like if uh, so many of the riffs on this record are improved by what uh, the bass is doing to add a real groove and rhythm to the riffs, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to pick them out of a lineup. You know, it's just they're quietly getting on with yeah. it, just like every other instrument is. These songs are so dense, and so much is happening in them that, like, by the tenth listen, I was like, okay, I can kind <laughs> of see what's happening here because it's six songs. It's structured as in the first song is chaotic the second one is you think it's going to be chaotic but it's kind of like kind of nice and quiet then you just have two absolute monsters which could just be 10 different songs really um and then we have a little ballady thing uh, track x before just absolute slaughter for the closer and i just like the symmetry of the album of like it's just, I don't know, it's six songs, three on each side, and they just flow beautifully. But to get to that point, you have to listen to it and understand what the fuck is going on, because there is a lot from these 
weird, surreal, absolute just lyrics that at first glance probably look stupid and like music, school, art school, pretentious, but when you actually like just sit down and read and just like get into it, it's more like, I don't know, to me it, it grew from like this, okay, we need this front man to just spout random Marky e. Smith stuff. But yeah, uh, and then you have a completely separate entity of like this bizarre, just f- free jazz, post rock, post punk fusion. That's just, it doesn't sound like anything. And it's hard to like, if you, you if you haven't heard this band at all, you're not probably not going to get anything of what any of us are saying because it's just you can't compare it to much other than maybe slint maybe i don't the even think this sounds like slint I, I, with a couple of exceptions so. yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But i don't i don't i don't either but people that's the common like if people has well, to well it's like, because they say yeah. that in the lyrics they are the second best slint tribute act well and they have <laughs> well lyric. Well, I believe um, that lyric was a response to um, comparisons that were already being made, and that, but I just yeah. find that whatever. Yeah, I'm just blown away, really, and I don't even know where to even begin with this. Um, but yeah, instrumental, as I was saying, is just an instrumental tone setter. It just sets up the whole album for like kind of what you're getting into, and then Athens, France is a pretty reworked version of the the first single that they ever put out with obviously um lyrical changes to reference the allegations and stuff shit that went down then you get to science fair which is just you think you kind of know where the where the land where the the tone is and then you're just thrown into this saxophone solo which just sounds like one of the best things I've ever heard in my entire life. Cutting straight into this synthesizer that also just sounds like one of the best things I've ever heard in my entire life. And just, yeah, you get these wild, just insane moments. Then you get to sunglasses and once again, the scale is just blown up and it's even more grand and pretentious and insane and just... It's really two or three or four or five songs in one of just a guitar solo open that just is a re- like this was one of the ones that was uh, this was the second single after Athens France back in 2019 and it didn't have originally the the the, the crushing guitar solo intro it just started with the riff there has been a lot of talk about how people don't prefer this version, which is fine. You don't th- need to prefer this one, but I think both versions have their own things. I do think the album version is a bit worse in terms of mix, but you know, it's such a minor difference that it's like, yeah. And also this one has lyrical changes, uh, again, uh, pretty obviously referencing the sexual stuff happening before but yeah i think it's kind of a better song because it kind of the first version kind of just feels a bit it doesn't seem harsh but it seems kind of like immature in a weird way but now it kind of sounds a bit better with leave your search all in the cabinet and burn what's left of all the cards you've kept it's be- it's a better line than leave your search in the cabinet and fuck me like you mean it this time isaac which is just kind of you know track x is next and it's the ballad of the album and it's it's just really the prime example of the violin and the saxophone working together in the most beautiful way and then we have the bar mitz- mitzvah breakdown of uh Opus, <laughs> which just absolutely destroys. I love this a lot. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, that's fine. I um, but what I'll say is just that um, I have copious notes which I will read on this album. But I'll preface, I'll preface this by saying that um, 
I have been completely beguiled by this record and, and fascinated and intoxicated. And it's a very early contender for, for like an album of the year, which I'm sure will still be around when we get to December in my listening habits. Um, it starts with the instrumental, which we've already talked about a little bit, um, apt to name, which comes in with a building groove with this really exciting guitar, uh, and, and, and it builds to a place, of real musical grandeur. Um, and you could listen to this one track and think you were listening to a pretty incredible band, but boy, does it only go up from here. Um, Athens, France, um, when the song quoted Phoebe Bridges it stopped me in my tracks and I had to sit down for a while um just to be listening to this kind of strange abstract rock song and get that kind of uh, paraphrased reference coming out of nowhere um it's a, it's a delightful thing but outside of that has this really beautiful groove um and a really beautiful story as well um with uh, the saxophone doing wonderful gliding work. Uh, Science Fair is a real highlight for me. Um, it edges along with the bass slowly prodding, pushing the song forward. I love the self-conscious acknowledgement of uh, the second best Slint tribute act. Um, the, uh, there is saxophone craziness that builds to a seething uh, synth line that um, it, it, it's, it's like a jump cut in an edit but with, with music. And when it goes to the synth line, it's just this really like fat. So it almost feel, feels like squeezed of its juices, the, the tone of this uh, synth. Um, and, and there is a breakdown outro towards the end of like earth shattering intensity and crushing heaviness. Um, and it is just one of the most compelling musical moments I've heard in a new record for quite some time. Uh, Sunglasses is on the face of it, a lyrically simple song about uh, what, uh, uh, an artificial performative aspect of accessorizing like sunglasses can do for you. But really when you get into it, it's about so much more. Um, I love the little details that are all over this record, but especially in this song, like uh, when he says that he's in, in the downstairs second living room's TV area, just that uh, specificity and, and the detail, it almost has a humor to it in the way in which it uh, so perfectly captures a certain variety of life, uh, especially my favorite verse on the record where uh, he says, um, I became her father and complained a mediocre theater in the daytime and ice in single malt whiskey in the night and rising skirt hems and lowering IQs um, and things just aren't built like this anymore. The absolute, uh, things aren't just built like they used to be, the absolute pinnacle of British engineering. Because um, I know people like that who say these things. Um, this is someone who reads the Daily Mail and has a pint of bitter every evening when pubs are still open and goes to see a football game every Saturday and likes to think himself uh, nouveau riche, um, but, but really hasn't sort of left behind the sort of vulgarity and the sort of, uh, that makes people who are more classical riche feel insecure because they reflect their own sort of almost like prejudice and bigotry without the sheen. Um, and I, I know this person and I know exactly the picture he's trying to paint with this person. I think he does a great job. Um, yeah. Um, you know, there are points in this where the music almost makes me feel sort of scared. Um, and again, the, there, there, there is an amazing outro to it um, where it has a, a slow moment and then builds into a verse of uh, constantly shouting things like, leave Kanye out of it, leave my daddy's job out of it. And it is one of the most viscerally exciting moments in, in, in music that I will see in 2021, where even though there is wonderful commentary and wonderful themes going on, and yes, it's very satirical and that's lovely, but all I want to do is just vibe the fuck out and dance and throw my arms up in the air and have a good time um regardless of that... context the sentence leave kanye out of it is unequivocally very satisfying to hear <laughs> and it's hilarious <laughs> yeah uh 
And again, especially uh, in that you've... voice. Leave Kanye out of it. Leave Kanye uh, out of this. Leave my daddy's job out of it. Um, track five, track X, um, begins in like a very calm, soulful manner. And after the calm and soulful beginning of Sunglasses, I felt like I couldn't trust this track. But no, um, it turned into a very lovely and beautiful cut. Um, again, this is the one with the reference Black Midi. And this does not sound like Black Midi because it's like Black Midi on Quaaludes, if anything. Um, I but I I loved it. And again, Opus, the closer. Like whenever this comes on, I just think to myself, "Oh no!" But in in a good way. Or it's like you're reaching the top of uh, a roller coaster, where where you're at the peak and you're about to slide all the way down, and you're just like, "Oh no!" And you go forward. <laughs> Um, like the best panic attack I've ever heard. Well, boy, do I have <laughs> the second best one this you? week? Ah! <laughs> well, hey, <laughs> get this reference. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> Stupid trick. You said she got the. Uh, oh, okay. You should have got the reference. Yeah, references, okay, references, references, <laughs> references, references. <laughs> Oh god, uh, the bass line is drinking like, a 40 so. in the death basket. Oh, okay. Is it? Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, but there's a wonderful use of like a rattling hi hat and, and a cascading bass line. And it's just so hooky and crazy. And the riffs are insane. Um, and it, it just it feels like um, if uh, the, the song that became a meme from uh, Lazy Town was, was a rock song. Um, <laughs> That's um, perfect. We are, we are number one. That's it. It's like, yeah. Um, oh, God, God, I can hear it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, come on. It's perfect. Jesus Christ. I Thank hate you. how accurate that is. I, I'm really glad to hear that. No, uh, what do I say about this record? It, it's, I've done, I think I've done a kind of good job describing it, but it is vaguely okay. indescribable. Um, yeah. it's, it's crazy, it's moody, it's emotional, it's vibey, it rocks out, it's got such incredible textures, and the phases the songs go, the phases the songs go in, it's so well constructed, and I love it, I love it, I love it. I'm so glad to get to talk about it, and I probably wouldn't have listened to it if it wasn't for this podcast, and, ah, I feel such love in my heart for it. Really glad to have listened to it. Same things that you are saying, just times... A million basically mm. um, yeah yeah and i'm glad to hear it this yeah yeah incredible record really glad to review it well if i may say so uh, <laughs> i believe uh tyler i believe was uh very uh <laughs> tenuous when he was like i don't know how anybody's going to respond to this album and i don't think i've talked about what i think about this uh with anybody i don't think um uh but uh n not to be a completely unoriginal fuck or anything but uh to be honest i fucking love this thing this thing fucking rules uh <laughs> I, I i was I, I, it helped that I went in with literally zero uh, expectations yes. beyond the fact that it was just like, this is a post-punk thing? <laughs> like, that. that's literally, I was just like, okay. And then I started listening to it and I'm like, I mean, not, not really, but kind of. Uh, as spoken previously, it's kind of hard to pigeonhole all of this. Um, if I could compare it to any particular sound, um, uh, this might be a weird comparison and might get me some funny looks, but it's just how I feel. Uh, reminds me a lot of, uh, I actually name dropped this a little bit earlier in the podcast, but the world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die. Has no, no, a I lot of moments. That there's just, there's like a shitload of musicians and it's got like a horn section and they do like post-rock shit and it's like there's there's just this amalgamate of all of these different genres and ideas that's happening here and it's happening in a way where it is immediate but it's also just like I haven't quite heard something like this before it's definitely like it's not post-punk but it's the world is a beautiful place and I know I'm no longer afraid to die <laughs> if it was post-punk. Uh, that is to say, it's a very nebulous combination of things, but like, 
it's just such it just sounds mm-hmm. beautiful i think like, that when, is the... when was the last time so, like there was a debut album that was this cohesive and unique at the same time oh fuck Lagenheim. fuck if i know Strange, um stranger in the alps Mm. It, it, it it sounds like it's just basically like hey here's a bunch of shit that you already like uh and i i was a bit nervous i guess going into it because uh you know you have the first track an instrumental it is called instrumental it's a bit long and it's just kind of like oh all right uh, but the instrumental itself is, is good. I mean, it's it's my least favorite part of the album by virtue of the fact that it's like not engaging me the way that their actual songs and structures and lyrics do. Um, but in and of itself, it's a great song. It's a great tone setter. I think it introduces a lot of tension to the album. I think it's like this album has a lot of different moods it's going for on a song to song basis. Hell, even on like a minute by minute basis, a song can be like really eerie and then all of a sudden can be like really sweet and kind of sincere and plaintive and like uncomplicated. And it's just like, you're just kind of walking around like listening to this and just it, it, it's so easy to just kind of soak it in. I feel like it's entering like my body through my pores. I love this shit. Uh, and it's got these, like, you know, you listen to the, the kind of shouty post-punky lyrics and they kind of washed over me the first time I listened to it just because it was like, I was more or less processing the more immediate musical ideas. But then the, the writing here is really sharp. It's really smart. It's really like personal too. I, I didn't really expect that. And not to mention structurally and lyrically brilliant on songs like maybe my favorite song on the record, which would be track X, which like, God, what a fucking show-stopping moment in songwriting and how it just like links to the next lyric over and over again it'll be like a a thematic tangential idea or a pun or a rhyme or something and it just consistently keeps building into itself fucking brilliantly and it's it's great i i love how it doesn't simultaneously take itself too seriously but also isn't afraid to just be more forwardly emotional i think that that's a lot of what keeps me at arm's length with a lot of people who delve into sounds like this or into genres like this is that sometimes the sort of irreverent humor and the 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 distance that they have from the things that they're talking or singing about is just like I can enjoy it but I also just don't really feel like the 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 authenticity is there whereas that is just very much not a problem here like uh with sunglasses which has already previously been uh discussed but I just I just think it's a very funny song like I don't know I, the, the idea of it being misconstrued as pretentious I suppose is on a surface level um is interesting but I, I don't know the 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 lyrics and the songwriting uh shit like uh and the bite of its blades reminds me of a future that I am in no way a part of and in a wall of photographs in the downstairs second living room's tv area which love that I become her father and complain of mediocre theater in the daytime and I'm just like for fuck's sake, like, I I don't know how you've done this with, like, four lines of lyrics, but I have, I I can perfectly imagine who this person is in my head and how much I hate fucking talking to them. (laughs) And the song just sort of proceeds to go uh, with with at that angle. And I also just think this is perfectly paced. It's perfectly structured. Uh, It's 41 minutes. It is a lean six tracks, and it's never boring. It is always indulging into being structurally, both lyrically and and sonically changing things up before like an idea can wear itself thin and none of them ever do but it's also like it runs the risk of being kind of eclectic and kind of all over the place but it doesn't I feel like the 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 big focus here I think is on two things and that's horns and grooves and the the big focus on these things lends it sort of that sort of cohesiveness I also want to shout out the like I'm not sure if it's this specifically because again, the inst- it, it, there's a lot of shit going on, but the bass playing is really good. <laughs> like really, really, really good. It, it just, these groups just sort of bury and claw their way into you, but also just, it, it, it makes the moments that I, I I'd say that I enjoy the most are the more minimal and spacious moments that the album sort of digresses into. I really, really like that shit. And normally when post-punk 
acts do that. It's just kind of like an excuse to be lazy, whereas here it feels more like a fully formed thing. And I don't know, I, I just, there is something really immediate and visceral about listening to this that I really love, that I really think has stayed with me in a way that I'd say only maybe one other release so far this year quite has. I'd say that as it stands, this is my favorite album of the year. Again, it's fucking February, so it's not like that really means all that much. But that said, I'm going to be listening to this come December, no matter what comes out this year, just because I love it. It's good. I have a fun time with it. It's ruckus. It's irreverent, but it's sincere. Yes, it's fun. It's all the things I look for when, like, again, keep stressing this fucking point, but not post-punk, but this is, it captures the spirit of what I want from that genre without necessarily adhering to its specific sound. Like, when I think of, like, the things that I want to to get out of that, it's just like, this, this right here contains everything I want. And it's, yeah. 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 It's it's also just such a tight record as well. Like, there's no fed on this thing. To me... Uh, not even me, the instrumental really like it's the weakest point but it, it's it's still good to me like um you either get on board with this or you don't like i, I can't see kind of being in the i, I mean i say this and you then someone probably will be but i can't really see being in the <laughs> middle on this because it's like Somewhat. it's a very consistent aesthetic that is incredibly tight and shows these different shades of it but is also never meanders at least to me anyway Um, And I've also seen some people complain that the album feels too short and I just thoroughly Mm, disagree. I think it is the perfect length. What even is that complaint? Like, yeah, I don't understand that at all. Well, I guess that if you like it, it if it some had people, ten more minutes and like it wasn't no, good. No, it, it like, can yeah. be a valid complaint though, yeah. because sometimes oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a record can feel as though it's ending just as it's sort of getting started. Yeah, and I think for reasons that you touched on beautifully, Laura, the way that this is structured in an almost um, symmetrical way, uh, I mean, gives it a real sense of uh, holistic um, consistency. But I'll save that until my review. It's also a good point that, like, I don't, like, these are seven people in the musical art school environment of, like, these are seven people with seven different music tastes all colliding and, like, forming into this massive pool of reference and just inspirations and things they bring to the table. So it's, like, they come from the same Black Midi uh, squid scene of like just it's just it doesn't sound like anything because it's the combination of seven people just like doing what they want to bring out in the world it's not like trying to cash in on like and and that that is an incredibly risky gambit Mm -hmm. yeah like you you risk you run the risk of of for so many reasons not just the fact that your album could come out sounding like a complete mess of influences and yeah. not having its own identity at all but also just the fact <coughs> that when you have, also, me. also Sorry, just the fact that when you throat. have so many people in a band the yeah. potential for fracture the potential for falling apart is you know it's totally there um so we'll see what happens um with this band i really hope that they go the distance and last um but uh yeah it's it's just impressive that they exist i think yeah Yeah, it's just a beautiful moment in time where these stars just aligned um and yeah they have like I, i i don't i don't doubt that at some point maybe it will consist of a different lineup but for now it's just vibing with this seven headed monster of just insanity but yeah, they also have a jam band with Black Midi called Black Midi New Road, which is very good. Of course um, they do. Yeah. It's very good. And you have Geordie Greep and Isaac. Just God. Two combination. Absolutely, two absolutely peerlessly idiosyncratic front men yeah. who just, and they like, just don't sound like anyone else exactly. And, and are completely. And then you have fucking that combination. And it's just. Yeah. I really hope we get um, the new the Black Midi sophomore record soon. Just on a completely different note, because this, yeah. that's a band. That's a band to me. Like I love Schlagenheim. I think it's a great album. But to me, it's kind of like more potential than delivery. 
and I um and I think they have it in them to make a proper masterpiece and I really want their second album to be that I saw someone in the Black Country Facebook group say that this is Schlagenheim on after therapy which is surprisingly <laughs> accurate. I mean, this is it's just... talking to its therapist. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but also kind of, it's six tracks. It's a bit longer, a bit more fleshed out. Instead yeah. of having reggae, uh, uh, I don't know, some of the I more long-winded mean. ideas on Schlagenheim. It's just, it's this, it's like they took Black Midi and just built on that mm-hmm. and just went to number four on the charts yeah um if i could just say something i forgot to say in my review um yeah. i want to touch on the moment where he shouts it's black country out there um <laughs> is a that's an incredible moment just on a visceral level and you know i there are several references to black country as an idea yeah. on this record um and of course referencing the title of your band like that's always interesting um but um, I, I love the symbolism of that because A, um, it's referencing this literal idea of like a hellish land out there. Um, it's also sort of referring to a more generalized fear and also incorporating this idea of um, that the, the, the world around us has been constructed to um, be threatening in the way of sort of that, that like post-industrial Midlands aesthetic that you see in this kind of music, I suspect. Um, and I just think it's a moment that really, especially the shouting it over just noise, really beautifully captures all of those ideas um, in a lovely way, I think. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic example of um, the real success uh, of um, uh, Isaac, which is that, um, he's both a a really great lyricist i think but also what makes the writing on this record so impactful is the combination of great right great lyricism and just pitch perfect delivery in every instance like he captures a very particular emotion whatever that emotion is with whatever line that he's getting across and what i think makes that moment at the end of science fear that you're referring to so potent is the fact that he sounds genuinely deranged at that point. Yeah, he sounds song. afraid. Like, f- yeah. Afraid, that's perfect, actually. Better than deranged. There's a genuine sense of terror there. And um, yeah, and, and it is a great and symbolic uh, lyric all in of itself, but it, it becomes 20-fold effective uh, because of the way he imbues it with that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's just every single song is perfectly delivered vocally and instrumentally. And I cannot, not since Get to Heaven have I heard an album <laughs> where every second is, every millisecond is a second that I adore, which mm. is just insane, which might be telling of where I'm going in the ratings. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. Yeah. Um, anyway, who hasn't uh, spoken yet about the record? August and Morgan. Okay. Well, I enjoyed this a fair bit. I had, <laughs> again, I had no expectations going into this. Didn't know what it was, um, as is fairly typical of being on this podcast. Because, uh, you know, I look at the docket every week and I see, like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah. So the first thing I'm greeted with is a fucking. Uh, the 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 jazz of satan uh <laughs> go going ape shit on instrumental um and that i i firmly reject the hypothesis that that is a weak moment um yes because it, it's i'm definitely not as hot as you all on this record for reasons that i will get to but I, I can't really say it has a weak moment. I find I think it's just so cohesive and tightly constructed. Like there wasn't, I don't know. But yeah, after instrumental, which is a really impressive tone setter for what the album is going for, the thing just kind of continues one upping itself yeah. as it goes along. It's just like, oh, 
That's oh, you're getting more interesting than this. Okay, that's cool. I think this band is really refreshing and sort of consistently inventive in the wheelhouses they're playing in. And um, I don't have much to touch on uh, besides what's already been said. But what I will say is where I differ from what's been said. And that I just, I, uh, I, uh, the lyrics are interesting to me in the sense that I couldn't with a straight face call them bad. It's it's more like I listen to them and I just know that the person writing them is the last person I want to be hanging out with. Um, <laughs> just fucking unbearable art school wimp. Um, I just want... <laughs> these are not my people. While my people may associate with these people, they are not my people. Um, they're like friendly... <laughs> Uh, you know, the, it's it goes to show that a friend of someone else is not automatically a friend to you. Um, words. What the fuck did that mean? I, no, I, I understood. As it said in the okay. Bible. You're doing great, Boo. <laughs> okay. Did um, you just call him Boo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the most disturbing thing you've ever said. That's, that that <laughs> says something, considering the things that come out of my mouth. Um... At any rate, um, <laughs> yeah. I she just... called me Boo on the podcast. Sounds like a Black Country New Road lyric. <laughs> I was going to really... say, that's fucking, you told me you really... loved me at the Black Mini concert. <laughs> she called shit. me Boo on the podcast. Yeah, it's just Christ. A bun- uh, this guy, and he's just a fucking millennial gen z fucking guy and he's just you know like oh my problems are so important and i'm like i don't give a fuck bro like you write about something interesting <laughs> um because i think um the way that the lyrics are constructed are really interesting i just wish i gave like even a fraction of a shit about what the guy is saying and unfortunately that does sort of weigh down my enjoyment of the record to a fairly substantial degree is just I just when it's just the music I am just vibing so hard and then he just comes like I love I he told me uh, Phoebe Bridges uh, lyric uh, 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 that's what the whole that's what the whole thing sounds like and it just doesn't you know it don't it rubs me the wrong way is the best way that I can say it. But that said, that like some tracks are just so good that like I can just kind of pretend that he's saying something I care about, <laughs> so <laughs> I can just kind of look past it um, and just fucking throw down with the weird freeform jazz post punk bullshittery going on here. Yeah, it's cool. All right. Uh, so you know you got the. Uh instrumental which i i really enjoy i personally think it's the best track on here i really love the kind of uh jazz influenced stuff on here uh there's a lot of middle eastern stuff going on with the bass lines i really like the way like it all convalesces instrumentally and all comes together i think that's very it's all very uh interesting to me the construction of it I really dug it. Uh, my problem is similar to Morgan's, although uh, it seems to a larger degree, uh, the vocals and lyrics, I really exceptionally do not care for at all. Uh, lyrically, I share a lot of Morgan's issues. I think he put it in a very, in a way I couldn't put it uh, myself to that degree of a uh, wellness I, I just don't find them don't find the stories exceptionally compelling I don't find the, the descriptions exceptionally compelling it just kind of rolls off of me and I, I do consistently enjoy the instrumentals though I think the performances of it is always exciting and interesting. I think the track Science Fair, when it kind of delves into 
electronic influences towards that track second half. I really got into that. I thought that was a really nice fusion of that stuff. Um, the problem being that uh, whenever I was really invested in the atmosphere of this album, uh, the lead singer guy just comes in to say some dumb shit and I'm out of it. Uh, I never, for the tracks that were like not the first one, I just never fully was able to like look past the lyrics and ignore it enough to the point where I, I could consider it something I enjoyed. And it makes the whole experience kind of unbearable for me that I... I, I'm just desperately struggling to, to get engaged with this instrumental stuff that I really love. And if this was like a, an exclusively instrumental record, I think I would really connect with it. I would really dig it. But the problem is it is not that. And I mean, granted some, a lot of people, more people than not like what it is. It's just, I find it a little, uh, yeah hard hard to get into yeah, for reasons i've stated it's just not my thing really that's about the simplest way i can put it so look i have um spent a lot of time listening to this record this week uh i listened to it the day that it came out i'm uh, just trying to wrap my head around it and i have to confess that i struggled uh with the record the instrumental uh talent is undeniable um and and i think i also to to a certain extent struggled with sort of it's not that um necessarily that isaac wood's vocals and lyrics put me off but just that i found them difficult to acclimatize to and and strangely off-putting at first but uh, I kept coming back to this record. Uh, I've listened to it probably 10 times now, I'd say. And definitely at least once every day um, since it came out. And yeah, I fucking love this. Um, every single time I listen to this record, I like it more and more. And it's not going to surprise anyone that I like this obviously i think that i think that um yeah it's like a one-to-one -one bet because <laughs> it just has so many different music aspects of the music of music that i enjoy um and i'm i'm not really sure what it is about isaac wood that initially threw me um because honestly just to give a nice little counterpoint to the last couple of opinions uh while i do like I stand by my statement that I think every member of this band is equally important to the way this record sounds and its impact. I would single out Isaac as the most um, as the strongest point of the whole album, um, and uh, I find him now uh, relentlessly fascinating. And I find the stories that he tells, the images and the scenes that are set on these songs to be utterly engrossing um and i think i like what i think jake's already talked about the way in which certain moments of this record the way he sings and his writing has, has a flow to it where it's kind of just sort of leading one line is kind of just leading into the next and there's a real sense of forward movement in the writing on this record that i think nicely synchronizes with the consistent rolling forward movement of what is going on instrumentally on this record. Um, so yeah, I think that everyone is locked in step um, and uh, there's really uh, no weak point at all. Um, even though uh, Isaac is my personal favorite part of the record, I cannot deny the brilliance of the opening instrumental. I think it is a perfect way to enter the album i think one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is that um this instrumental and also the uh instrumental on the closing track are examples of jewish klezmer music specifically um so uh let's not try and cancel morgan for being an anti-semite for calling it satan jazz and <laughs> we'll chalk that up to a misunderstanding um but no it does sound it sounds, it sounds evil <laughs> It's a better description. 
Um, no, even even, sounds... even imposing even, as hell. Even Jewish people have a concept of hell. No, I'm just I'm just jazzing, <laughs> joking. But no, it's like to me, it's just, like uh, just call me an like anti-Semite on air. <laughs> He said, let's not call him an anti-Semite and chalk out to a misunderstanding. Um, Dis- 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 Disney's going to fire me. I'm <laughs> so they should. You do not suit their vibe. Um, yeah, true enough. But anyway, uh, yeah, so this instrumental is uh, an example of klezmer music, which I will be honest and say I wasn't familiar with um, beforehand. But then in retrospect, I can say that does kind of sound like um, the mental state of the bar mitzvah scene at the end of a serious man. So yeah, I can. Kind I fucking. Of... I thought the fucking same thing, Tyler. These this album and that movie have the mm-hmm. exact same energy. Yeah, no, I, I watched that movie. I watched that movie yesterday, and and I I agree. And then what's interesting were, about you were, that? You were missing uh, several stars. I might note. What? Let's shut yeah. up. Talk about that. Later. Let's. <laughs> what's, what's missing? Yeah, shut up. Fuck you. <laughs> We're, I'm reviewing the album. We're not talking everybody, about everybody box reviews. Every goddamn podcast. I don't get to interrupt people now. <laughs> I see how it is. <laughs> the Foo Fighters segment was going to be the one where we fell apart. Now it's this. <laughs> no, like it's quite yeah. fitting. Um, but no, what what I wanted to say on this note of the serious man comparison. Um, is that uh, that movie, it kind of does capture, obviously, a sort of sense of the ennui of being you know, in your 40s and married and living this kind of like life that's just kind of happening to you and that you have no sense of control over. And uh, this record kind of captures, not that the feeling is exactly the same, but I think the feeling of kind of listlessness of your early 20s. Uh, but I also think that there's a curious um, thread in the writing here between this satire of a particular kind of person, this kind of upper class. Um, I think of them as I think of it like as a young conservative um, or young Tory, probably person yeah. who um, young Tory who lives this. Um, very sort of sheltered existence, um, trying to mold themselves into this particular archetype that is now completely out of date, um, but that represents the generation that their parents came from. And and I think this is all kind of perfectly um, captured in Sunglasses, which is just mm. um, one of the best songs I've heard in years. Um, Correct. Uh, it's just a fantastic piece of music and I think um, yeah and, and and the writing is absolutely the best part about it um, but yeah it's this it's this portrait of this kind of like person who who lives this kind of like vacuous existence and it's very inherently satirical like I guess I could see how you might miss that if you're really passively listening but to me the satire is very obvious like i mean references to mother gripping the neutra bullet and l- lines like leave my daddy's job out of this if anything it may be Certainly. too pointed um but i don't think i think it gets away with it um and i think the greatest success of the song is how it puts you in the mindset of this person who uh you otherwise would feel no connection to and then just embeds you deep within their seething rage and their insular um self-serving view um the extended rant about um <laughs> fucking the the ends in the absolute pinnacle of british engineering is a beautiful beautiful section where you just get this image of this person who's kind of just had an argument and just sit seething on this massive leather couch just with their fucking hands folded like fucking ben shapiro fucker just like having a fucking <laughs> you know thinking about you know how fucking stupid and 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 worthless everyone is um but i think the, the greatest success of the song is the way that you get embedded in this per in this personality to the point where when the song is really ramping up and they're shouting and again the lyrics are really fucking funny in this song as well like um <laughs> you know leave kanye out of this um that's a line that um you know 
could have could have been really bad um but i think again because of the perspective you're embedded in it's just really fucking funny um no. and and uh but the, the way you're embedded in that so that when the music's ramping up and they're shouting i mean i feel the energy my blood pumping like i'm yeah. there in that even if i don't share the perspective i'm feeling the emotion in a way that you yeah. know normally i would feel completely uh distant from a person like, like, this, like but... even today when i was specifically sitting down to make notes on it for which i need my hands when that like moment in the song was playing all i could do was go they can't get out of it and just yeah just dance along to it it was all i could do yeah and and um there's uh lovely bits of um beautiful specificity in the lyricism on this record mm. to um things like there's a line in athens france where he says uh, main line to the yui boom and i think that's the <laughs> first time i've ever heard a yui boom talked about in a song um, which I think I don't just, know what that um, is. It's, it's like a, a portable like microphone, a, no, portable speaker. Sorry, um, that, it's a uh, line that I wrote down. That's like a really contemporary piece of slang. Um, in Athens, France, he says he's working on the glow up. Which, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah that, no, but like just that Yui Boom reference specifically. That's a very kind of like uh, sort of a niche piece of technology that I've never heard anyone talk about. But and it's so it's not this archetypical symbol of like you know, hipstery, white girl, wealth or whatever. But it, yet the second I hear it and recognize it, I'm like, yeah, that's just a perfect little symbol. That's not too obvious. Um, and, and Athens, um, Athens, France is a great song, incidentally. And I think another really good sort of song, uh, portrait of this narrator observing his relationship to these sort of empty vessel figures in the world around him judging them um, but also kind of like skirting around how intangibly connected he is to that world himself and I think um, there's obviously and this is where I kind of come back to that point where I said earlier where this record um, threads a line between pure class satire and just like uncomfortable realness like um, Isaac Wood's can't pretend that he is not particularly privileged because he is and that he doesn't come from a very particular scene and doesn't have a very particular personality he is not and, and he, he does the great job of avoiding doing a kind of hypocritical satire where you're poking fun at a particular kind of person yet you are really not that far away from them i think isaac does a great job of um, you know, kind of shooting himself in the foot on this record a little bit well, mocking himself. I don't think there's any sense of self-seriousness in any of the um, commentary on this record. It's just very upfront about the fact that this world that he exists within is absurd and these people live um, selfish lives, um, but that he is nevertheless in, in close enough proximity to that to be if not culpable, then at least, um, you know, part of it. Um, and, and that's beautiful. But, but you also get these um, moments like Track X, which is one of the most gorgeous pieces of music I've heard this year, uh, which is sort of strips away most of the satire to be a little more direct and emotional. Um, and I love that he cited uh, as a reference point for this track, um, Arthur Russell's World of Echo, which is this very esoteric, Arthur Russell's this great, or was this great um, art pop singer, songwriter, folk singer, songwriter, really, but who also um, worked with really strange effects and made this really weird, lucid music. And Track X definitely kind of reminds me of that. Um, but there's just beautiful imagery uh, in this um, song. Um, and and I, I, I can't even really explain why, but there's this deep sort of sadness in it. Um, like it, it just captures very kind of fractured snapshots of, of forgotten moments that nevertheless are kind of part of a time that there's a real nostalgia for. Um, it's a very nostalgic song actually. Uh, and I love that um, 
it, it's very difficult to do something like this, but the chorus of the song is basically just him trailing off and not being able to actually express the emotions he's feeling. He just says, I guess in some way, and that's it. And then the, the other vocals in the mix kind of manage to underline the, the point he's making about like being unable to describe or unable to understand what he's feeling just through the wordless vocals themselves. In many respects, uh, aesthetically, the song even made me think of Yola Tingo, um, which is a very different band, but which has a band that are able to conjure the same sense of beautiful spaciousness and fragile vocals. Um, uh, and, and that was just a beautiful reference point. Um, I haven't even like touched on any of the notes I wrote. Um, but yeah, one thing I wanted to say, I, one thing I wrote down about Isaac Wood is I really love his voice as well. He has a very, I think a, a more dynamic voice than I think has maybe been appreciated because he, he is often singing in this kind of like snarky, witty, um, biting way, but he also is capable of this a really dynamic emotional range as well. And I think the what I wrote down is that he's kind of like the vocal love child of Joe Casey and Jamie Stewart. Um, <laughs> he has that drawl and that kind of like dripping wit of um, Joe Casey and Proto Mata, but he also has um, the sense of kind of fragility and like a, a, a vocal that's kind of like haunted and and that his voice is kind of like almost trailing off at points like Jamie Stewart and Shushu. Um, and, and it's a beautiful melding of those styles that makes it really, um, really captivating, I, I think. Um, and I've kind of alluded to this a bit as well already, but I one thing that I think hasn't really been noted enough about this album is how fucking hilarious it is um and and you do get lots of these moments of pathos where there's a, an emotional directness like in track x for example uh, or opus as well but so much of this album just makes me smile um uh and i think it's a and it's a self-aware absurdity that i think is tonally um managed so perfectly to not be kind of uh, distancing or or weird or too aloof it just feels really pointed um, and I don't think that Wood as a writer or the rest of the band as instrumentalists take themselves too seriously but I think opening a record like this with this klezmer uh, instrumental that is a very kind of is letting you know that from the outset so that you can be prepared before um uh, Isaac even comes in with his lyrics that this is an irreverent band. It's not a band that, um, so you're, you're primed for that, I think, which is one of the reasons why I think the instrumental works so well where it is. Uh, it gives you a sense of the emotional tone of the record. There's this um, harshness and tenseness to it, but also a kind of levity to it because it's got these really kind of uh, lighter and dare I say, funny tones in it. Um, uh, but I don't think that makes the music purely frivolous either. Like, again, it just reads this really great balance between this really absurd uh, hilarity and just a kind of gritty emotional tangibility. Um, Wood makes an oblique reference to the band as uh, the second best Lynch tribute act. And what's funny about that to me is I've already said I don't think this band sounds particularly like Slint. I have to say it's one of those melting pot of influences that I think are there, but that the coalescence of what the band is means they kind of transcend that. So, um, but what is cool about that is, and what is I think kind of self-aware about that is that the song that's in Science Fear has a very similar structure in its building intensity uh, to Good Morning Captain off of Spiderland, I think. It has the same kind of rollicking instrumental that's kind of, um, it's, and I listened to the two songs next to each other once that I had that thought, and I was like, yeah, they're totally kind of channeling the same energy, even in the way that both songs have this like really loud and powerful finale payoff. Um, but there's enough unique character and bewitching charisma in the performances of everyone involved to make sure that you know this is Black Country New Road. It's not Black Country New Road doing slint. It's not any other band. 
Um, they're running entirely within their own niche. Um, and it's a niche that's it's related to other bands for sure. Um, I mean, they obviously brought the Black Midi comparison on themselves with the lyric drop, but really I think this band sound, I mean, they're definitely closer to Slint than Black Midi, which is to say, I don't think they're particularly close to either, except in the pure sense that they are weirdos that are willing to do weird stuff and make your guitars sound strange, I guess. I don't know. I just think this is a, <laughs> a very different band. Um, I think all other comparisons to other bands are either purely aesthetic or they just fall over when you take into account other aspects of the music. Um, yeah, and like I said, the incorporation of the Jewish klezmer music in instrumental and opus, for instance, it adds the strange and jovial and fresh feel those pieces have compared to your other bog standard art rock post-punk band who would never incorporate such a strange uh, sound relative to the norm anyway. Um, uh, Laura's already made reference to the fact that uh, at least two of these songs exist in heavily rewritten form from the original versions that were released, those being Athens, France, and Sunglasses. Uh, I have not been a fan of this band as long as Laura has, so I didn't have the time to live with those original versions, but I happen to think that both songs are improved on the record. Um, I particularly, I mean, I just think the lyrical changes are all uh, I'm not going to get into them because um, I'm me and Laura are the only ones that are probably familiar with the originals anyway, so it's not worth going into. But uh, I think that without without exception, all of the lyrical changes are smart and make the songs better. And um, I particularly love the way that um, Sunglasses comes in with this really noisy kind of guitar section and then sort of settles into this groove. One of my favorite sections in the song is when this kind of like the rage of and, and sort of blinding emotional intensity of this narrator kind of gets peeled away for this bridge where um, he just kind of opines, I'm so ignorant now with all that I've learned, which is a, actually a really nice couplet that is beautifully self-contradictory and um, also weirdly emotional. Like when this part of the song plays, I'm like singing along because I'm like, yeah, I feel ignorant as fuck too. Um, and, it's, and it's beautiful the way the horns kind of coalesce around um, Isaac in this part. It's just beautifully creative like every single instrumental decision that's made on this record is um, very smart and is always in service of the song and of the emotion at the core of it um, just really 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 great stuff um, yeah I I don't even think I have particular favorites on this record I think that the, the, the it's just incredibly consistent I don't think there's any particular weak points either um, I I've already shouted out I just can't now that Laura said it I cannot stop thinking about the symmetrical structure because that hadn't occurred to me until now but yeah it is beautifully packaged and uh I think that I'm hard pressed to find anything about it that I'm not um really into uh and uh it's a if we're gonna keep bringing back the black midi thing it's like that's a band that were have come into existence at their beginning just overflowing with ideas incorporating all these different instrumental styles and creating a, a, a debut record that is really great and has some amazing songs on it that feels very much like scatter shot as a whole project whereas black country new road have arrived fully formed it seems in a way that is just very satisfying. And if anything, I'm just hesitant about where they might go next because this is such a focused project. But at the same time, you can see the potential to make their sound bigger and, and build on it more too. So I think they've basically put themselves in the best possible position for a new band releasing a debut record. Um, and I think that it is um, one of the greatest um, debut albums in living memory. Okay, let's go into our favorite tracks and ratings. Um, Jake, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, three favorite tracks are going to be uh, track X, Opus, and uh, Tough Call. I like every song here a lot. Uh, Athens, France. Um, least favorite instrumental, uh, I give it an 8.5. Neat. 
Uh, August. Uh, favorite would be instrumental and science fair. Least favorite, uh, nothing in particular. I, I'd give it a five out of ten. Okay, Morgan. Uh, I would <laughs> say my three favorites are Opus, uh, one of the other ones, Track X, and then Sunglasses. Uh, my least favorite is uh, the man Isaac Wood, as I made clear. Um, <laughs> seven out of ten okay so that comes to me uh just give me a sec um right my three favorite tracks are science fair uh, sunglasses and opus and i am giving this record a 10 out of 10 uh i don't have three favorite tracks i want to something i was going to say before but i guess it's more fitting to say here Uh, is that this is a very rare record where, I mean this, at some point, every song on this album has been my favorite song on this album. (laughs) And it's literally just changed every time I listen to it. And this Uh, has been me with my favorite album of all time. I I know what you mean. Yeah, so um, it's a uh, 10 out of 10 for me also. Yeah, nice. Laura? Favorite tracks every single millisecond of this thing mm-hmm. least favorite tracks none of them um i give this a 10 to 100 out of 10 <laughs> nice uh, i just want to say the last episode the last album the last new album to get three tens was uh, the latest deftones record um and in terms of, this got an 8.4 on average, um, which matches up with six records we've talked about. Uh, the Glowing Man, uh, Tallahassee, uh, Shapeshift With Me, Sign, Ascension, and Splane. Good company. Mm. Good company. Extremely good company. It, um, yeah, a couple of other records are given a 10 in there. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Tallahassee feels like... Tallahassee and for the first time being on the same uh, yeah Feels yeah, yeah. Weird, it makes sense right. doesn't it yeah they're both a 10 so you know <laughs> I agree anyway yeah well, sorry what were you saying Tyler oh no nothing I was um no actually genuinely nothing I was just kind of trying to stamp put a stamp on the section <laughs> Okay, now it is time um, for just the four of us to talk about a very special release, which is um, the debut studio album project record LP thing from um, Blurry Screen, if you're looking at Jake, um, Sersha and the Agenda, the musical project of our very own Sersha Selway, and her um, debut project entitled Panic Attacks in Public. I, I keep wanting to say Painting of a Panic Attack, but it's Panic <laughs> Attacks in Public. Um, and yeah, so a long-awaited record. Uh, this mm-hmm. has been in gestation for a while, so to speak. Uh, if you have seen my interview with Sersha, which I published um, very recently. Good um, interview. Uh, we'll read that yes. yeah if you haven't read it i should say um it does have i think lots of good insights about the recording process the influences yeah. on this record um and the themes and goals and aims for it uh if you haven't heard it and are curious to get an insight of um what search's feeling was and approach was with it um then that will be the thing to read i think um but yes we are obviously a little bit biased because we're friends of Sersha's. Um, but uh, I mean, I for one like this record quite a bit. Uh, I, I think that it, it it's is... not the first time we reviewed somebody's album on this podcast on this show either. So that's true. We obviously reviewed uh, in one of our first episodes, funnily enough, we reviewed yes. um, August's um, most yeah. recent release with as Glacier Flower. And we will obviously be reviewing um, the upcoming, um, the forthcoming uh, th- third album. Third one, yeah. Glacier Flower, mm-hmm. when that inevitably releases. Um, but yeah, as for Panic Attacks in Public, I think it is a really strong debut. I think that 
Um, it's very, again, bias is strong. And of course, it's easy to say this for us or for me at least, but it is unmistakably Sersha through and through. Uh, yep. It is... Uh, Oak yeah, punk! It is... Well, no, it's, <laughs> no, that's interesting you should say that though, because it's folk punk until it isn't. Which, yeah, and, yeah. and there's a really interesting um, musical direction that this LP takes that I have to confess I was not expecting. I was what I was expecting was, um, you know, 45, 50 minutes of variations upon folk punk. This idea, of, like heavily strummed and distorted acoustic guitars and booming soundscapes and and, and... reinventing Sergio Solway. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly <laughs> what I was expecting. And but to Sergio's credit, it's not as if there isn't necessarily a precedent for the direction this takes if you go back to her last release gender dysphoria um it has that a little bit of that kind of stuff with tracks like skin tight bodysuit but it also has tracks like um uh the toxic masculinity i think it's called where the music is more ethereal and strange and there's more involvement of electronic sounds and more heavily recognizable like in the studio or, or rather on the laptop creating the song in a new way uh, exploring different kind of uh, avenues for expressing the feelings that she wants to get across so you kind of got a hint at the fact that Sersha was going to stray from the folk punk blueprint on this record but what really struck me was just how this record is is le- like the folk punk aspect of this record is actually kind of quite a small part of it rather than just being the the central part but not everything um you get um i think this is signified really strongly with um the choice of opening track on this record bad seeds which is a very low-key song uh, acoustic number um referencing obviously nick cave and and touching on a very particular kind of like um emotional fragility that is very kind of moving and soft and and not kind of what you would expect from an album opener like it it really um threw me a bit and then you kind of so that kind of sets up this kind of subversion of what you might expect and then you get sort of a stretch of um more of songs that are more akin to the influences that we think of when we think of Sersha, like um, your Frank Turner's and your Against Me's and and that sort of thing with um, 99 Revolutions uh, and Ben Shapiro Blues and um, uh, the one that comes after that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, fucking What on Earth I'm Missing, that one. Yes, that one. Yeah, 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 that, Those, yeah. uh, and I believe uh, What on Earth I'm Missing was, was uh, Sersha's choice of lead single as well, which I think... Um, you know, is a smart one because it kind of gives you what you're sort of expecting to sort of give to let you know that this record is going to be thoroughly uh, in that sort of niche that she loves so much and works within. Um, and and yeah, but it also gives you a little bit of a taste of the fact that it might not all be quite like, you know, your 99 Revolutions, for instance, which I think is the mo- song on this record that is most clearly indebted to specific, um, very... Uh, recognizable Sersha influences. I love the way uh, this track is constructed. Uh, it builds up from uh, a, a quite a, a softer intro and kind of layers on the instrumentation in a way that's quite satisfying. Uh, I like the way that um, I think Sersha would be the first to admit that um, she's not the most, um, not the vocalist that has the most range necessarily, but she does push her voice in ways on this record that I think are commendable. I like the way that she really kind of like just starts getting into it on on Unknown Revolutions, singing really, really fast at a certain point. Uh, I think when she has that kind of energy, um, she really kind of captures it in a, in a really good way. Um, um, but for me, I have to be honest, um, the most, the stuff on this record that really grabs me and affects me the most, and I think uh, where she kind of shows surprising strength, although maybe I shouldn't say surprising, but certainly strength I wasn't expecting to see to the extent that it is, is more on the back half of this record, which I think is more exploratory for Sersha, more um, emotionally complex 
uh, in a lot of ways. I think of a song like This Shit's Brand New, which is one of my favorites on the record. Um, um, yeah, incredibly emotive and moving. And it's a song where Sersha dares to rely on the strength of her you know uh personality as a front woman and her ability to carry a song through her emotions and through her performance rather than necessarily layering on all the instrumentation to try and make it sound like more she is not afraid to peer things back on this record and there i think um generally without exception the moments of um minimalism in that regard are some of the most effective um yeah completely uh i think of in particular my favorite song on the record which is black magic which is undeniably indebted to phoebe ridgers as saoirse has stated and we talked about in the interview um but also represents one of the most sort of complex portraits of her emotional state on this record a lot of these songs are quite dark deal with the kind of being at your lowest point Sersha in the interview and throughout the album uh, has reflected on the way that 2019 in particular was a very tumultuous year for her and and then the added uh, shit heap of the pandemic last year kind of meant that her arc of trying to bounce back from that was really hampered and she's been sort of in this kind of stuck in this state of perpetual sameness that she's been really really wanting to escape and so she's obviously channeled a lot of that emotion into this record the bulk of which was recorded um in the last few months i think but many of the ideas and 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 some of the core pieces of the songs have existed for a lot longer um but i and so that's interesting the way that um certain stuff knowing that certain stuff has existed for years but that it's all kind of become imbued with this very specific um result of being uh of growing up um because there's one point of the record where she alludes to being t- just 20 years old i think think i want to say on don't you forget but it might be a different song um and obviously we know that she's 23 so that um that lyric being unchanged um is kind of to me is directly signaling you to kind of think about the distance between perhaps when the song was written and where search is at now and um so the whole thing kind of gives the record the sort of despite the fact that so much of it was written before the pandemic it kind of gives it a bit of a feel of a pandemic album of a quarantine album of a of a self-reflection record where Sersha comes out the other end of it feeling a little more confident and feeling a little bit more I won't say optimistic but hopeful about the possibility of improvement in the future and that's I think where Black Magic is the strongest track on the record because it is the it's kind of the moment of realization for that, um, and and it makes it uh, really um, really beautiful and affecting and emotional. But also, you know, you're rooting for her, and obviously we're rooting for her because we're her friends and we want her to, um, you know, be in a place where she's happy. Um, so to feel like you get to know her in a really intimate way on this record and then get a sense of um, f- from the sadness a way out is, you know, is I think quite affecting. Um, I have other thoughts, but I think I'll sort of step back and, and see what you guys have to think at this point. Yeah. Um, damn, Tyler been spitting. I feel inadequate. Uh, I, I mean, would be just real easy to be like, I agree, dip, but <laughs> largely I do. Um, I think that sort of the, it, it is interesting that Tyler pointed out that like there's less of the forthright folk punk sound that's really more channeled into specific songs than it is the album as a whole but I think it still is imbued with that same kind of spirit uh the the influences being worn on the sleeve here like you know we said Frank Turner uh, a lot of the 
uh, and against me and, and what have you. Um, but I mean, as implied by the title of a song like This Shit's Brand New, I, I love the structural change here of just sort of the slow dive into making an album that's sort of like her songs just kind of get structurally more and more ambitious as it goes along. And starting off with This Shit's Brand New, you have these songs that are like, they're a little bit more formless. They're a little bit more stream of consciousness. And the way that it's sort of built to that so far in the album uh, is really, really affecting. It really makes you feel like you are spending the entire duration of this album getting to know Sersha from a very specific snapshot in her life. Um, whether or not it's it's right now or like when she was 20, all of those things just sort of like, it, it definitely paints a good broad early portrait of just like somebody who is stuck between the, the oncoming advent of adulthood and like true independence. There's sort of a struggle here to like, of feeling on the inside and then looking outward, feeling kind of trapped, not just like, from like quarantine wise, but like in one's own body and one's own skin, which, um, you know, <laughs> thanks, relatable, ha. Um, it's also just very forwardly frank in a way that a lot of folk music is, uh, like on my favorite song on the record, which is strange just because it's probably the most unassuming, but that's, and one of the shortest and that's Song for a Friend, uh, which just, I, I just get, really emotional listening to this song not to imply that like I don't on other tracks it's just that this one I just remember very vividly listening to this the midnight when it dropped like walking around alone in my house and there's just like a certain point in this song where I was just like <laughs> feel 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 a lot here man you, you you've captured this uh this very specific mood very well um I also just think the songwriting is basically uniformly excellent. Um, it's There's lots of really great hooky moments on the first half that just sort of make it really easy to blitz through. You got shit like 99 Revolutions that has this like really like distorted fucking uh, guitar that just makes it a complete fucking rager. Very fun to play in your car by the by. Um, and, and it's just, it's got all the aggression and, and bite that you would want out of music like this, but also the, the introspection as well. Um, I guess I will take it upon myself just because Tyler already put all, a lot of what I want to say and how I feel far more elegantly than I could. I will uh, touch on the basically the only problem I think this album has, and that's inconsistency, mainly when it comes to production. And it's not necessarily that the album is not produced well. I actually don't really think there's a track on here that's like super let down by the production. It's really just that on a song by song basis, some of these songs just don't really feel like they were, like sometimes it just feels like one song could have been mixed like a year and a half ago and one could have been mixed two months ago. Like if they could have been made in totally different places just because the the way they're EQ'd or the, the, the way some of the instruments come in, it's just like, it just kind of sounds uh, inconsistent with the rest of the record and, and does disrupt the flow a little bit for me, especially on the first half, which is like the more eclectic and like immediate first half but I feel like the the second half when it gets a bit more down tempo is a little bit more um it's a bit just a bit more smooth sailing but like even then still it's like she produced all of this music herself and <laughs> did it on her own and none of it sounds bad so like how can you even really complain too much uh, about that I suppose like again it's not like she had access to a fucking studio or somebody who's been doing this for a long time it's just like I don't know it would be like complaining about me having spelling errors in my fucking books which I undoubtedly do because uh, we can't do this shit so it, it is a bit inherently limited but to to focus on such a thing would sell the the honesty and and also the fun of the record short like it is a very emotional album but it's also just a very fun one in its first half specifically uh, and I just applaud making sort of an ambitious structural um 
undertaking on your first record like if I was going to make an album I certainly wouldn't want to I would just I would play it safe and Sarah absolutely did not so I mean that deserves rapturous praise as far as I'm concerned it's good yeah, yeah. it's very good I can uh, go into this now um uh, Bad Seeds, I think it's a very uh, nice, very lovely opener. I think the sentiment is is very relatable within the track. I, and I think, uh, as all of us would agree, I'd assume, uh, Sersha's personality absolutely shines through on this record. Like, I don't think there's another person on earth who could have made this record Yep. It, with the in the same way it's done like there's plenty of records that feel completely stock this is distinctly her and that's very refreshing considering the uh at this point nearing double digits number of punk poppy records we've reviewed that are just flavorless personality lists <laughs> slosh so this is, it's very, so what I'm getting at is it's very refreshing to have such a sense of personality, such a sense of like definedness on this record. That's not a word, but whatever. Uh, I think the instrumental outro here maybe went on for a hair too long, but that's kind of nitpicking. Uh, 99 Revolutions uh, is essentially like a redo, as I understand it, of the Green Day song of the same name, and it, it kicks up the record's energy in a very satisfying way. Uh, I thought the piano notes in this song sounded quite out of place with the rest of it, a bit janky, uh, but that's that could just be me. Uh, ben Shapiro Blues, I think, is when, after we've had a, a bit of a, a rough start not bad but rough inconsistent i think now we're getting into the stride of the record with ben shapiro blues i really like the the blaring kind of fuzzy main guitar line it has a lot of drive and energy behind it uh even if i do find the lyrics a, a bit uh cliche i think that it is that the energy on this song is absolutely intoxicating that leads us into What on Earth I'm Missing, however, which is just wonderful. I think this has like the catchiest chorus on this whole album. It's very, and that's something that I think she's she's done very well at, writing very addicting, catchy tracks, uh, of course, with a lot of emotional catharsis behind them, but it lends very well to the final product and when the vocals are kind of double tracked, I think, I don't know if that's the right term, but uh, towards the end of this song, uh, it just becomes absolutely heavenly. Uh, David Fincher was born in a stint, a bit of a, a more simplistic tune on here, but nonetheless, very catchy, very hooky. Uh, as Tyler pointed out, this shit's brand new uh, is a really interesting point in terms of like, you really see how the, number of influences Sersha is bringing into this record, like beyond just folk punk, uh, which we've uh, so memed her for across this podcast. Uh, but I think it really shows a sense of ambition in a very interesting way. This track, really good. Uh, it Gets Better is maybe one of my least favorite moments. I thought the sentiment was a little played out, uh, but it was a shorter song. So ultimately I'm not too upset with it. Uh, so Long though is very painful. And it's, I think as, as Tyler was talking about the kind of quarantine aspects, I think the, the self-induced isolation uh, referred to in this track's lyrics really hits home in the conditions it was made in. Uh, Don't You Forget is really a properly exciting track. I think the uh, what's being commented upon here 
very just I mean I like the lyricism is what I'm trying to say and and of course we've got a uh, black magic kind of maybe the best point on here which is just this kind of slow much more atmospheric track that that reminds me of some like lifted era bright eyes shit at points yeah good comp yeah and yeah, uh that's good. the and the lyrics here are just properly heartbreaking i i do uh i do share jake's sentiment to a degree that a bit of a bit of this is uh a bit of the production can can run on the inconsistent side but ultimately i think what what shines through most is the ambition of, of this whole project and and how it falls into place i think is so so interesting so exciting to see on a debut record but it also gives me hope that uh in like a year or two from now or however long she takes to make a record uh no rush of course uh that that will come out as a, like sophomore a effort win <laughs> i i know she's already writing new songs yeah no uh but i i i imagine that would be like that'll be like take everything from this and just make it stronger and stronger and i'm i'm very excited for that and i think this is also a really uh really great place to start so, and i don't want to say like my excitement for what comes next in any way negates my enjoyment of what we already have because it already is a quite good solid uh foundation to start off uh making records with and i i dig it Right. Well, um, yeah, y'all well, stole well, well. My, my goddamn talking points, but you know, <laughs> um, yeah, I largely agree with most of the things that you will have, uh, you will, fuck. Sorry. Look, good music, a lot of the time, real simple. Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest... Uh, selling point here is easily Sersha herself. Um, she has a very uh, engaging presence on here. Fuck me. Uh, vocally and as a songwriter, especially as a songwriter, I think. Um, I think this album is consistently lyrically excellent. Um, and while the, I think a lot of, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, but yeah, I, th I think uh, a lot. While a lot of what um, she's doing is obviously limited by the fact that it is just her, and you know, she's not Dave Grohl making the first Foo Fighters record. Um, Who among us is? Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that does limit sounds somewhat, obviously. Um, I'm really impressed consistently with what she does within that framework, um, especially considering what I was expecting, which was, you know, again, folk, pug. Um, yeah, I just. I, I found this to be ambitious in a lot of ways that I wasn't expecting that I really uh, found myself enjoying. Um, yeah. Um, what, I, what I will say, though, is that I, I do somewhat agree with the, um, the consistency uh, points that Jake brought up. Um, but I, I also find that the album itself has a really nice progression to it um, just in the way that it sort of changes up sounds as it goes along until it finishes as something almost completely different from how it started um, but perhaps more concretely I will say that I found a lot of the um, the rhythm section work to be a little shoddy um, at times which again there's only one of her and 
circumstances being what they are. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like I would be doing a disservice to her if I didn't mention that some of these drum tracks are a little rough. Um, I'm also, I'm also just very, very rhythmically oriented in terms of music that I listen to. So I get really nitpicky about that. You're a drum snob. It's fine. A little yeah. bit. Um, you said the guy wearing the Foo Fighters shirt. Can't imagine. Dave Grohl. I hardly knew her. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We'll take some fucking Tylenol, Morgan. Yeah, I will do that. Um, good ass record. Second favorite of the year so far. Yes. My top. My top two are records made by people. <laughs> I like. We know. <laughs> I know, yeah. right? Sixty-six percent uh, of my top three. Hell Suck yeah, on that, Dave Grohl. <laughs> hell yeah. No, Favorite I've... tracks and writings, then. Indeed, um, Jake. Why don't you go first? Okay, uh, three favorite tracks: "Song for a Friend," uh, "So Long," and. I want to shout out Funeral Blues, but I do have to echo the sentiment of Black Magic. Uh, least favorite song? I fucking... Uh, bad Seeds? I mean, I it's good. I, by, by merit of the fact that something has to be. Um, and I give it an eight. All right. Um, my three favorite tracks would have to be... Um, I'd Wait. say, don't you forget, um, black magic and probably, probably this shit's brand new. Ow. Least favorite, uh, I would echo the scent. No, I would say, uh, 99 revolutions. And I would give this like a seven and a half. Wow. Morgan. You took my Man. least favorite track and my rating. Thanks. Um, uh, my three favorites are um, Black Magic, Funeral Blues, and uh, Song for a Friend. Uh, least favorites is 99 Revolutions, and rating is 7 and a half. Um, my three favorite tracks are This Shit's Brand New. Um, black magic and uh, i guess funeral blues i wanted to shout out i didn't get to shout out funeral blues but i think it maybe has my favorite instrumental on the record um which i think it kind of needs to yeah. have because it's a song that is built around a poem that Sergio didn't write um but i did want to shout out that i think that she complements the poem beautifully with the instrumental on that track it's a really strong closer and another track i didn't shout out that i'll shout out really quickly as well as i really dig the experimentation of so long which i think takes a lot of musical risks um but works out um pretty damn well uh least favorite track um i just for some reason i just don't particularly vibe with david fitcher was born innocent but i don't think it's a bad song uh i'm gonna give this an eight out of ten and that Hello. gives us an average of 7.8, which is roughly the same as, um, fucking, I don't know. Let's find out. Fucking. Uh, oh, God this damn, is perfect. Uh, uh, God has nothing to do with this by Backwash. <laughs> I fuck with black magic. Yeah. Uh, uh, Autekers LP5. Uh, Thrice as V Sue, uh, <laughs> Mr. Bungle, self titled, and Vaudeville Villain. True contemporary, Mr. Bungle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mr. The Mr. Mr. Bungle Mr. influence is deeply felt. Very, <laughs> very much so. Um, fantastic. Right. Well, that is the episode. Um, tune in next week. We're going to be reviewing uh, some albums. fucking shit. Um, yeah, fucking no. Oh, new slow tie, Tyron. Oh um, yeah, that's right. We're going to be reviewing yeah. that, uh, and we're also going to be reviewing uh, another sophomore record, the Haley oh, Williams' yeah. second album, something about flowers. 
Flowers for vases. Oh, okay. Creative as a Spanish opposed. word that I can't remember. Flowers for vases. Uh, very and creative. We've got term. a record club from one Miss One uh, Jake. Oh shit! Is it? Um, yeah. It's, I, I guess that means the record club is uh, Brockhampton's Iridescence. Oh. That is the one. That's oh. The one. Fuck. Oh, that's going to be a hell of an episode. But oh, no. stick around if you're watching and check out our record club for this week, which is on Cardiac Sing to God. Um, and yeah, um, thank you for watching. <laughs> we never say thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. That's probably oh, something you should say. Watching. Probably something we should say more. Um, like, scribble. Subscribble. <laughs> Drop right. a like. Back over London. Hit the bell Back on Chicago. Little Caesars, a family company. <laughs>